This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and a very warm welcome to our Sunset Drive coming to you all the way from South Africa in the Greater Kruger National Park and we are first welcoming the first school joining us today especially all of you school kids we got the North Landing Elementary from Virginia Beach which has not joined us before a very big welcome we got two other schools which have been with us before welcome back and that's the College Park Elementary from Virginia, and we also got the Hethorn Elementary School from Georgia. We're very excited to have you on board, and my name is David, and on the camera today is Sebastian, and this is the time for you to ask us questions. This is the time for you to give us your thoughts, to let us know what animals you'd like to see and please through your teachers keep asking questions to us and tell us maybe the animals you'd also like to see it feels a bit drizzling here if you look for those animals that we're just seeing there the impalas it's drizzling a bit and that doesn't worry us very much uh, the temperatures are about 22 degrees celsius and 72 degrees fahrenheit look the first animals we are showing you today to welcome you on the sunset drive are uh, impalas impalas are very iconic or they're very common antelopes that you see when you come to africa of many antelopes of this size these ones are very numerous you almost see them everywhere you go in the whole of african continent so when it rains like this they're not very comfortable because they don't hear very well and the rain makes them not see also very well so that's why you see sometimes they're putting up their heads and they're just looking and they're all going together because the more closer they are the more eyes they got and they are able to see their surroundings so remember we got different antelopes in Africa these particular ones have no horns and would call them females and if you see anyone that is similar to this with big horns that will be a male I am not alone out here in the African wilderness we got another girl called Taylor who is out there and we got a gentleman also on foot and let's go to Taylor who will say hello to all of you Hello to every single one of you that are sitting in your classrooms and hopefully keeping nice and dry and like us out here in the Sabi sand. My name is Taylor and on camera with me is Viam and we are going to try and stay as dry as we can today because the rain seems to be getting a little bit harder now and there's lots and lots of lightning and thunder around us. Maybe we'll even try and watch the storm at some point. Now, remember, if you have any questions about anything, about coming on safari, about the animals, about the weather, all you have to do is ask your teachers. Shall we continue, Vim? Let's go. No? We're not going anywhere yet. Here we go. No? <laughs> We're having a little bit of motor difficulty at the moment. Our car doesn't seem to want to. <laughs> Wendy, wait, Wendy, Wendy might be officially dead. <laughs> Let's try again. I don't think we're going anyway. Okay, we have once more because the storm is coming. Go, Wendy! Go, Wendy! Shout, go, Wendy, with me! <laughs> I think we are not going anywhere, I'm afraid. This is very exciting stuff. But uh, I'm going to try and, of course, uh, get this car started. Maybe Rolf is going to have to walk from the tent to the open plains. Let's go see if he's willing to do that. 
Well, everybody, it's a very uh, rainy day out here in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. But you know what? Never fear. We'll always talk about all sorts of different things. And my name is Ralph Kirsten. And on the camera, we've got Craig here in the tent with us. We should have been walking out in the bush today. But, well, with the weather that we've got today, it's not going to be possible. But never fear. We're going to be looking at all sorts of things here. And I know that David uh, was just looking at some impala and there were lots of females there but there were one or two males that were walking around and they've got those big horns like that now it's just nice to see a good comparison of different sized uh, horns because they look rather small when they're out there in the bush don't they but these little things that are growing out of the horns aren't normally there. It's only uh, once the impala would die that you'd start to have these things growing out of that. So don't expect to see that on a live impala. But what I want to do is I just want to make a couple of little comparisons. Because if we take a baboon's head and we put it next to the impala's head, well, you can see that a baboon's head is quite a bit bigger than that of an impala, isn't it? So it's quite impressive. A baboon is a rather large animal, isn't he? But um, then we can also put the impala next to a buffalo head. And you see how much bigger a buffalo really is. He is a monster. So that's a very, very impressive there. And um, well, the one that gets a little bit smaller than the impala is a springbok. That's a springbok with the horns up there, right in the middle. So that's one that's very similar to a gazelle that you might find in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. But, well, this impala is the one that we're seeing mostly around the Sabi Sands at the moment, and also the one that the leopards are busy eating lots of. So they've been eating lots of these. Why? Because all the males are fighting with each other at the moment, and so they're not worried about the leopards, which is quite silly, really, because that's the reason why they're all landing up in the trees uh, being dinner to the leopards. So I think these guys need to have a little bit more sense and um, maybe they'll be able to survive a little bit longer. And if we take it next to a warthog, look at that. A warthog skull much bigger than an impala. But you wouldn't expect that, would you? Because the impala, he looks much taller, he looks much bigger than a, than a warthog. But the warthog got a very big head with very big tusks as well. So he's quite impressive there indeed. Now, this rain is really starting to come down, and I wonder if Taylor's uh, being able to get out of her little spot with her vehicle. But um, we also saw that those Impala, they have lots of uh, wet on, the, on their backs at the moment with the, with the rain coming down. And what do they do? They start to put their hair up, and they try to get warm a little bit. And that's how they do it. They put their hair up, it traps a little bit of air inside that hair on their back, and that way they keep a little bit warm. And also, they're all huddling together as well because they can't go inside or go into the tent like we have and stay out where it's dry. They've got to just be out there in the bush and just huddle together, maybe go underneath a little bit of a bush, but there's nowhere else for them to go. And at this very moment, when it's raining like this, they actually they can't hear the predators coming. So it's actually good for the predators as well. Now, Rune, we, when we go out, especially on bush walks, and we find some of these skulls, normally we leave them there because we want to let the bush uh, take control and all these things to decompose and be part of the ecosystem. The only reason we've brought back a few of these skulls from the bush is so that we can show you uh, all these interesting little things about them. But normally we leave everything in the bush. Remember, you take only photos and you leave nothing but footprints. That is the most important thing. Say that with me. Take nothing but photos, leave nothing but footprints. That's the best motto when you go out in the bush, isn't it? Now, you see these little uh, things coming out of the horns? That is from something called a horn moth. And it's the only little worm that eats these horns. Now, Avery, you've asked the question, how would I tell if this is a male or a female? Well, Avery, very easily, because with Impala, only the males have horns. So, 
What is that then? This one has got very big horns, hasn't he? So it would be a male. When, we, when David maybe shows you some more impala, you'll see that lots of them don't have horns like this one does. Those are all the girls or the females. And sometimes you see very little horns on the impala. Those are the young boys. They're still growing, but they'll start just with the little horns and they get bigger, bigger, bigger. They're not the same as antlers like you would find on the deer. But um, now, Serenity, you want to know how big is an impala? Well, if, if an impala stands next to me, he'll probably be about that big, all right? With his horns over there, and that's how he'll stand up, okay? Not much bigger than that. And they're one of the smallest of all the antelope. And look how big he is compared to me. If he really wanted to, he could hurt me, couldn't he? And with these horns, that's what he uses to fight with the other males. And he'll also try to use it as defense against the leopards and the lions. So this is his defense. And this is what he fights with the other males. And you hear a lot of uh, banging of horns at the moment in the bush. This noise as they bash into each other and they're grabbing each other with their horns like this and trying to get underneath so that they can put the sharp part into the, the chest of the other impala. And some of these impala, they can fight all the way until one actually dies, which is uh, very sad, but that's the way that they find out who's the strongest of all the males. So it's very, very interesting indeed. Now, I wonder if David's been able to find any more impala to show us, because then we can talk about all sorts of other things. Rough having showed you how impalas compare in terms of size, I'm trying to get to more live impalas out here. But at the moment, we're enjoying a bit of showers and we're celebrating some rain. We haven't had rains here for quite some time and we have just getting this this morning it was a bit gray and a bit overcast and we thought it could rain but now it is slowly spitting and drizzling and getting a little bit bigger but what happens that does not stop the animals to do what they will always do i mean i'm sure you know unlike we human beings when it rains we shall wear some raincoat like what i have on if i'm outside there i'll get an umbrella or i'll make sure i go under and get some shelter animals will still be out here doing their normal thing the difference will be that they will slow down in feeding they may want to take some temporary shelter go under say a huge big tree and wait for the rains to stop before they can move as i was talking earlier about impalas you saw them like grouping together and the reason for that they might keep their warmth together and when it rains they will not see very well it's not very very clear you know when it's misty or it's foggy and there are heavy rains and you see your parents driving the cars they'll have their you know wipers on the windshield going like this like this so the visibility is never very very good and that's why you see sebastian is making his lens also to look good because of the rains we are getting so the animals also don't see very well and they'll choose to stay in one spot so that if a predator comes they can see and then also that helps because like now we have some thunderstorms you know, going on, they may not also hear what's happening there. But when they stop, they can comfortably concentrate, sorry, and hear what could be happening in the outside world. Jackson, that's a very good question. Can the animals starve to death? Yes, if there's a very, very huge drought, and also it depends on what type of an animal. Anybody, even human beings, if you don't eat for a long time, chances are you die. But the animals here adapt very well 
to be able to get food if they normally eat leaves and they dry some animals like elephants are so clever they can dig some food underground so it could happen if there's a very very huge drought but under normal circumstances animals will always feed themselves they'll always have a drink they'll always have a nap and they'll always move around enjoying their lives so remember to keep requesting your teachers to send us as many questions as possible and also some comments and thoughts of what you think you'd want to know as we continue enjoying this beautiful rainfall and then finding out some more animals for you. All right. So we also drive sometimes looking on top of trees. You might see a big bird on top of a tree. And then we also keep looking now at the moment under all the big trees because that's where most of the antelopes would be. Big animals like elephants for example, they might not be worried by the rains that you see here and rhinos also, buffaloes also, they are huge, they have a big body surface area and you'll notice they'll keep eating. Now when you're asking or you'd like to know if there are lions here, yes, we got lions here and on particular days or on particular game drives, when we go out, we'll always spot lions. And I hope, Devin, you watch the movie The Lion King. Maybe that's why you like lions. Yes, we got lions here. Now, lions being cats, they are more affected by the rain than the other animals or than the other mammals because they have so much hair, so much fur on their bodies, so, and they don't want to get wet. Those ones, the cats, the lions, cheetahs, leopards, they'll always make sure they're not rained on and they'll stay in a nice, you know, a nice place without rain. And I can tell you, Taylor is also enjoying and celebrating the rain like me. I'm celebrating that we got the car started. Woo! We're back out on safari again. We are super excited. I don't know what we're going to find though because it's now raining very, very hard as you can see. So I'm going to drive really slowly here and start checking in some of the trees to see maybe some of the birds are trying to get out of the rain too because well, I wouldn't want to be out in the rain at all. I've seen one bird, Viam. Can you see the starling? There we go. That's a brave bird, though. That's a birchal starling. Look at it. It's getting soaked. I think it's under a little bit of shelter. Oi! Not much, though. But I don't think it's going to be doing too much flying. Let's see, where is it going to go? There you go, going up into one of the silver plus leaf trees where it should be much better up there. Now, Sophie, everyone always asks me if I had one superpower, what would it be? And it would be to be able to speak to animals. And then I'd be able to answer your question really well because you wanted to know, do animals do anything for fun? Well, little animals like to play around a lot. So like little lions and leopards, maybe elephants, they all like to play. And, but I suppose it's not really for fun though, because as they're playing, they help strengthening their muscles. So it's like oh, when you're running around, playing sports, you're getting nice and strong. Your muscles are growing. So it's the same for the animals. So they'll be doing things like that. So little lion cubs will wrestle with one another. Leopards will practice their stalking. Cheetah, the young cheetah cubs might run around lots with their siblings if they have any. And the elephants will be trying to train their trunks because that's the hardest thing for an elephant to train. So I suppose it might be having a bit of fun when it does things like that. But they don't go to the beach. They don't go skydiving or skateboarding. Never seen any animals ever taking up that kind of a hobby. <laughs> now, I'm convinced we're going to have to see some birds and things sitting around here. Now, Liam, that's a very good question, asking how do the animals find water when it's not raining? Well, they're watering holes here, so after lots and lots of rain, it, it fills up into these, some of them are man-made dams, some of them are called wallows, which are created by the animals, and they fill up, and they can drink from that. Otherwise, something like an elephant, 
that's got a very good sense of smell and can sense water underneath the ground, they can go and dig for it. So they can go to a riverbed that's maybe completely dry, it just looks like sand, and will only have to dig maybe three feet or so, maybe not even so much. And then all beautiful fresh water will come up. So they can do that too. So there's lots of ways that the animals can try and find water. But if you have a drought and there hasn't been any water around for a very, very long time, then that means there's not going to be any food around either. And that's a big problem. Fine, they can always find water. Well, they, they have to travel a long way for it. But if there's not lots of food, that's no good. They're going to go hungry. They can't just pop to the shops like you and I. Well, we are going to keep looking for anything. And I go to Ralph, who's well got a tent full of surprises. Well, everybody, now there's lots of rain outside and I'm sure it's going to be quite difficult for the guys to find any animals because they're probably also hiding up in the bushes and maybe down inside their burrows. And one of the animals that does like to go inside a burrow is a porcupine. Now, these are quills from a porcupine. And what are quills? Well, they are actually the porcupine's hairs because they... Um, they, they are modified hairs. You can see at the base there, that's where they would be attached to the porcupine. Right there at the base. And it's got a little thing there. That's like if you pull one of your hairs out. You can see the little nerve at the bottom of the hair. If you're brave enough, pull out one of your hairs and you'll see that it, just at the tip, you've got a little piece of, or it's like a, a, where the nerve is attached to the hair. Now, so these are modified hairs. And they go on a porcupine, which is, uh, the porcupine looks like this animal over here. It's actually a very big rat. And he's got lots of quills on him. Look at that. So all of these on there, and the ones that I've got are these spiky ones there at the bottom. Some of them are quite long, like real hair, but most of them, these spiky ones at the back. And they use this for self-defense, because if a lion or a leopard comes, what do they do? They turn their back to them, and they've got those porcupine quills sticking up, and if the lion comes too close, they'll hit him with it, and it will get stuck maybe in his mouth or in his ear, and if he can't eat or get Get them out, well, he's going to be in big trouble, isn't he? So these are quite difficult. Now, Michaela, you're asking what is the strongest animal here? Michaela, I would have to say that that is definitely an elephant. And here's one of their bones. This is an elephant bone. This is just one of the bones off of their leg, and it is huge. So it's almost like a dinosaur. And the elephant is the largest land mammal. The only animals bigger than elephants are in the ocean, like your big whales that will be bigger than them. But I can tell you, their bones are very heavy. And... Um, I just want to also show you a, a couple of small little pictures of animals that they're going to be looking for a little bit later on in the show when you're not here anymore because once it gets dark, they're going to be finding all sorts of little uh, hairs. Now, Lily, you just, sorry, I'm going to come back to the, the hair that I'm talking about there that we might see a little bit later. But uh, Lily, you wanted to know how long the quills of the porcupine can get. This is one of the quills that they use to, to, for defense that would be at the back of the porcupine over there. But the, the ones that are the longest are the ones that come off their back over here, like this on, on the picture there, these long, thin ones. Those over there, they actually look a lot more like hairs. And over there, those are the long, long, thin ones. And they're not, they're not as hard as these. They're quite flexible. And they're probably uh, maybe two rulers. You know the rulers that you use to underline at school? If you've got two of those, put them next to each other. And they're probably uh, about that long. That's probably about the, the length of, of the longest quill of a porcupine but remember a quill is actually a modified hair so it's the same as that and these were some of the first pens that were made in africa the first pens that they made were from birds feathers but then they also used to use porcupine quills and they can dip that in a little bit of ink and then they can use that to write as a pen so it's very good, but you'd obviously need something on the end there. And that was where you would dip it inside the ink and then just do a little bit of writing like that. So, a very nice 
little pen that we pick up in the bush and it's the little hairs that the porcupines drop and it's very useful. Now I'm going to send you on back to the guys in the bush and let's see if they're staying dry. And yes, we are still enjoying the rain here and what we want to show you now is a Taman Mount and look carefully just ahead of us there and what you see is what you call a termite mound. Termites are types of insects that you see all over the world and they are very very different types. There are so many of them and they say there are over 3,000 types of termites in the world. So the termites will make mounds like this and if you look carefully it got some holes in it and those holes will always help air to come in and air to go out but apart from the termites that build these uh, mounds and live inside here we also got other animals that live inside there and Diana you'd like to know what is the smallest animal here where we are. It depends on what you are looking at but if we would look at the animals that eat meat and the animals that eat meat we call them carnivores. There is a small mongoose that is called the dwarf mongoose. Dwarf mongoose is one of the smallest animals but also we got some other small animals with very bushy tails. I'm sure Diana you have heard of squirrels and we got one that's called the tree squirrel and you'll always see them on the trees jumping and feeding and trying to go around and play. So squirrels I would say for now or where we are are the smallest animals and back to our termite mound there we'll be looking at it more and just to let you the small animals I was telling you about earlier that's the called the dwarf mongoose will also live in such termite mound now the impalas you've been talking about Taylor got some for you we do we found a very small herd of impala can you hear all that thunder See how nervous they get when it's rumbling? I would be very scared too because this is very, very good hunting weather for lions and leopards. Now, these impala have got very, very good eyesight and also good hearing. You can see, look at those ears, they're moving around, trying to listen if they can hear something walking through the grass or something brushing against the leaves. They've got to be very careful. Now, Will, you've asked how much does an impala weigh? They're not very big. These are the girls, these are the females. I would say they probably weigh about between 30 and 40 kilograms a female. And then the rams, that's what we call the male or the, the boy impalas, they can weigh up to about 60 kilograms or so. So they're a bit bigger. They've also got a pair of horns on them, which I'm sure weigh a little bit too and contribute to how, how big they get. But the females don't have any horns, you can see, just those big ears. Look how wet their coat is. Now when they're nice and dry, they're one of the prettiest antelope out here. So these aren't deer, these are antelope. And they've got such a shiny, slick coat. It's so beautiful, but not on a day like today. They're gonna to be very soggy. And I think a little bit later, they're gonna get quite cold too. Because I'm coming into autumn now, so we're getting the change of season and the temperature isn't so hot at night. Jake. You've asked this afternoon, what do you call a baby impala? A baby impala is called a lamb. A lamb. So the females are called ewes. The boys called rams. So it's kind of like sheep, hey? Exactly like sheep. So the same thing applies to the impala. It's beautiful though. Oh, see how jumpy they are? They're worried that if they see anything. Now, even though there aren't many mammal species out this afternoon, we're going to be lucky and hopefully see some reptiles. And I think David has got the first one. And 
mammals now we are living mammals and we are coming to reptiles and kids look what we found for you we got a tortoise there and tortoises are in group of animals that are called reptiles and actually what she was doing she was just having a drink well he doesn't seem to be walking very well I am not sure she's a bit old or she isn't well but if you look it is walking coordination it's not very good but most important this is totally different animal from what we have been seeing before and this is the leopard tortoise you got different types of reptiles or different types of tortoises in Africa and he was just having a quick drink there and you see part of his shells could have been coming out or shading off and I'm looking at it just on one side on the left side and not on his or her right side Nyanja, you were asking what happened to the tortoise's shell and a few things could have happened maybe he has a small little issue with uh, her shells and they could just be you know coming off by themselves it would happen like all of us would get sick or maybe he's a bit old and she is you know getting tired because of age those are some of the possible reasons that could have affected the beautiful color of the shells of these tortoise here tortoises will always eat green matter grass vegetables or tortoise or leaves and Megan you'd like to know how big do tortoises get this is a smaller one by any standard but some of them are huge huge depending on the type or what part of Africa you see them and some could be almost the size of say a turkey Megan if you know how a turkey looks like some could be as close as the size of a turkey he's slowly now also maybe running away from the rain sorry what did Vega ask bring the question again for me please JJ you're asking what would happen to the, uh, the the tortoise shell and I would say if they get a bit older if that was your question they may lose all the shells or sometimes they get attacked by predators for example leopards which will eat them and that is always a challenge to them So slowly she's looking for some shelter away from the rain, just like anybody else. Every you are asking how long can tortoises live for? Most reptiles, including tortoises, live for a very, very long time. And some tortoises have been known to live for almost 60, 70, 80 years of course depending on the type of tortoise and the amount of food they get and where they are but 70 80 years or 85 has been recorded as the years tortoises would live for you notice now how she blends in very well in that bush and if we drove here maybe five minutes after now we could have easily missed it Luckily, we just found her on the road drinking some water. And because the condition of her shells are not very good, that's why maybe he does, she does not want to be rained on. She doesn't keep uh, getting water on her inner body. Because that shell is very important to her. It protects her from strong sun, from the rain and from other animals that may want to eat it she'll always pull her head inside and her legs and hide herself inside that shell she is carrying
And there she goes, and slowly she's protecting the head first to make sure she doesn't get wet. Lavu, you're asking, how do the shells form? And after the female tortoises lay their eggs and they hatch as they grow, they start forming on top of their bodies slowly, slowly until they mature because they need those shells to protect themselves. And at times, if you look on a shell of the tortoises, you'd estimate or you can have an idea how old a tortoise is by counting the number of rings on the shell of the tortoise. We'll continue seeing whether we'll see more animals as we enjoy the rain, but there's someone who is sheltered very nicely away from the rain. Well, I'm not the only one that's sheltered from the rain. This little guy who's also a reptile, just like that leopard tortoise that you've been watching, this is a gecko. And it's a Bibron's thick-toed gecko. The okay, guy's moving his toes a little bit there just to keep himself stuck to the tent. You see he's hanging upside down, hey? Very, very impressive. And he's one of the lizard family. And very big eyes and those little white dots on his back as well. Now, Brian, some animals will look for shelter, like this little gecko. He's found himself a perfect spot here in the tent. So some of the animals do uh, find spots, but there's other ones like the impala and the leopards and just, um, well, put up with it, really, because they don't have any choice. They don't have a house. And they don't have anything to go into. So, well, they just have to sit there and just hope that it ends quite soon. But there's some other animals that like making burrows in the ground, like the beautiful art fark and that I want to just show you here. Now, Ellie, this is one of my favorite animals here. Uh, he's called an art fark or the ant bear, the one that walks around um, and that makes very big holes inside the termite mounds. And we generally get to see them at night only, but they're quite secretive and it's difficult to spot them. So they'll be walking around at night and all those holes that you've been seeing in the side of termite mounds, I think David might have shown you one, a very big termite mound and they dig holes in the side. They also eat termites. So those are the ones that make lots of holes, but there's lots of other animals that use those holes to get in away from the rain, like warthogs like we showed you the big skull of the warthog the warthog will also go in the holes from the art fark and he'll go in there he goes in backwards and he'll hide in the in the burrow and that's not stealing the hole of the art fark he's actually just using that um, because the art fark goes off and makes lots of those burrows so you'll have all sorts of animals using that especially when it's raining like this uh, the warthogs even jackals and all sorts of other animals so it's very, very interesting. And now it's crazy because normally um, when it's raining and cold, there's no reptiles. They're all disappeared, hiding, and they don't have any energy because it's not warm. But I tell you what, today they're everywhere. They are everywhere. They're thirsty. I bet they're super excited about the fresh water that's filling up in the grooves of the road. How cool is this? A big old leopard tortoise having a drink of water. That's so cool. Let's see if it is going to have a drink of water. Maybe we, we just missed it. Perhaps it's been out already and I'll slowly start heading on home. So on days like this, you have to be very, very careful when you're driving about because you don't want to drive over one. Now, Jerome, this isn't actually a turtle, but this is a tortoise, so this one lives on land, although the leopard tortoise can swim, which is pretty cool. Not many tortoise species that can swim. So I, I don't actually know how it works with turtles. 
I've only ever seen turtles in the wild twice in my whole life. There you go, having a drink of water. So I'm not really sure if, if they float or not. But you know who we can ask is perhaps Ralph knows, or perhaps Ralph can have a look at the internet and see what the internet has to say. I don't do much scuba diving at all, so I don't know too much about all the marine animals, but I can tell you about these ones. Now this tortoise is very, very thirsty because over the next few months, when it gets a little bit cooler, they're not really going to come out very much. They will every now and then, so they're not like the bears that will go and hibernate for winter and then only come out in the spring. The tortoises will go to sleep on the cold days, but they can be up if it's a nice warm day. And the days are really, really nice in this area in winter. We don't have any snow. Sade, now you've asked why are the shells different colors? That's just a different pattern. Every, every tortoise will have a, a different sort of pattern on their, on their shells, but it also depends on the type of tortoise that it is, so the species. So this one is a leopard tortoise, and their shells are normally quite speckled like this with black, they're, and they're the biggest tortoise that we see. And then the Speaks Hinge Tortoise, which is another one that we see as well. This has got a bit more of a flatter shell, and it doesn't have as nice colors normally. Normally they're just sort of dark brown, and, uh, and they don't have as much yellow on. I always find the leopard tortoises to be beautiful. There's some other tortoises that are even prettier. Asia, you've asked where is the tortoise's home? Well, his home is actually on his back. It's like he's, uh, his shell is basically his home. But what tortoises will do... It's not like bears that maybe go climbing around in caves or anything like that. If they find a log that's, well, a big tree that's fallen over and that the ground is a little bit hollowed out, they can also dig a little bit too. They've got sharp claws on the end of those feet and they'll go inside there, so they'll nestle themselves in, in that. Any burrows going into the termite mounds, they'll go into those too, just underneath a shrub. So they don't really have a specific home. They'll find any, any natural cavity that they can and they'll use those. Very cool though. Very thirsty tortoise, however. Anyways, BM and I are also very thirsty. We're wishing we could have Amarula. But let's go across to David now, I think. David, I think, has got the kudu, I'm not sure. Yes, from the tortoise that we're just seeing, we have been very lucky to have some, you know, spotting or talking about tortoise from Taylor. And now, not very far from where we saw the tortoise, we got different animals and we call this one the kudu, K-U-D-U, and they're types of antelopes. Earlier we started with impalas, and if you look at this carefully, they got stripes on their bodies, and most important, you notice how they're sheltering themselves from the rain. Look at the rain falling down, taking straight lines, just like the stripes on those antelopes. And if you look at them carefully, you can see them chewing, and wonder what are they chewing. Brooke, you're asking, can the animals get lost or separated from the parents? Most of the animal parents are very, very good mothers. And they make sure that their young ones are not very far from them. So accidentally, that happens once in a while, for example, if you get, say, a predator. A predator is an animal that eats another animal comes and tries to eat the mother or the baby or any one of them in the group. So when they run away, they split and they go in different directions. So for some few minutes, sometimes the animals get separated. And once everything comes back to normal, then they will, you know, the parents look for the young ones or the brothers look for the sisters and they all come back together again. You notice that kudu, she got her ears all out. And what w would happen? It is, they're, they're trying to listen to anything that could, you know, go wrong. That's why as much as it's raining, she doesn't have her ears, you know, against her neck or against her head. She needs to stay alert and nobody no animal sneaks on her.
Brooklyn, you'd like to know how I got interest for me to go to the world of safari. Where I come from in my village, we had so many animals around. And every time I would go chasing impalas, play with them. And I thought it's a good thing to educate people and kids like you about the wildlife. And that's how my interest gave me this job. And that's why I'm happy to give you all these interesting facts and show you such beautiful animals. And you'll have more for you to see and to give you other facts from the tent. And thank you very much for having joined us, the new school and the schools that rejoined us again. And we hope to see you soon. Bye for now. Now, everyone, I'm just having a look at, at these uh, wonderful tortoise shells here because it seems like we've had quite a few out this afternoon and lovely to see that. Uh, they're all coming out probably to fill up uh, the bursas full of water um, and now welcome back to all the the regular and the usual viewers and any new viewers that are joining us um, thanks for joining us also if you were uh, along for the school drives but now that we back to business let's talk about these uh, to uh, turtle tortoises that have that have been out um, in the bush now and as i say i'm pretty sure that they're out uh, at the moment busy filling up their bursas because normally we don't generally get winter rainfall and they would then have to be storing that water for that almost entire six month period, which is a long time for them. And they'd need to be relatively dormant as well, very little activity. Um, and uh, so it's very interesting that they're out now because uh, this is unseasonal rain and they're obviously filling their boots. And I was absolutely enthralled by watching that one that's busy drinking uh, just like it is. Now, one of the th and that's also one of the reasons why, if you ever come across a, a tortoise, never pick it up. If you are going to pick it up, literally just pick it up like that. And the, why would you want to pick a tortoise up? It would be to sex it, to see whether it's a male or female. Now, please do not ever do what I am doing right now with a live tortoise. Because you can actually twist their gut by turning them upside down like this. But why would we want to see underneath? Because if it is flat here underneath on the carapace, it would be... A, female, all right? And if it's concave like this one is, it is a male. And the reason why it is, now there's, these are two different species that I've got here, but it, it's just so that it gives, uh, you know, logistically a little bit more uh, practicality for mounting a female so that it can go in like that. Okay, so that's where it would climb up. Now we've got a leopard tortoise here and a speak, uh, speaks hinge tortoise. So obviously we wouldn't have two different species mating with each other. But that's the reason of that concaveness uh, at the bottom of the shell. So if you are ever faced with a little tortoise and you do want to sex it, just literally go like this. And that's only if you really have to. Just have a look underneath like that and put it back down. Now... So the reason for not picking them up is because you can twist their gut. And another reason for not picking them up, especially during the dry season, which we are supposed to be in now, or starting anyway, but here's the rain. Uh, because if you pick them up, they can very often release their bursa as a, a protection mechanism. So a defense mechanism or protection mechanism, they release their bursa, which is all this liquid, and you would go, whoa, and you'd leave the tortoise alone. Off he goes into the thicket and he's survived the attack from whatever predator, whether it's a lion or leopard or a human, you've dropped the tortoise and he's walked off. However, he's now emptied his bursa and probably all the uh, moisture that he has for the next six months. So he could dehydrate and very easily die. So we don't pick up tortoises in the field. We definitely don't turn them over. And obviously, if that tortoise does release its bursa, you've probably um, signed its death warrant. What is a bursa? It's basically like its bladder, okay, but for tortoises. Now, something else that I did want to show you here nice and closely, because we can, David was talking about aging a tortoise from these little ridges. Um, and these are the scutes, very similar to that of um, uh, scales on a fish. 
and obviously when it dies these can come off quite easily so these are all separate little scutes now if we look at the ridges and the troughs uh, on the scutes themselves the the ridges over there are periods of very good resources and mostly water as well as calcium that this animal has had and then the trough is a, year or a period or season of little resources. And then so it goes up again and down again and up again. So we can age an animal from these scutes, but it's not years per se. It is times of little resources to high resources. It's all about what the animal has been feeding on and drinking that equals then these ridges and troughs. And the fat ones would obviously be uh, optimal prime conditions with lots of food, lots of calcium, lots of water leading to a ridge like that. And then obviously a little trough with another big uh, season of excellent resources. So it is absolutely fascinating. And if you had to go back in the years, you would be able to work it out uh, according to the, the rains and all of that kind of thing. But it's not years per se. Anyway, let's, um, let's continue with the show and head you back to Taylor and I'll sort out things on this side. Right, look at all this filling up in the road. Quite crazy, don't you think? We're going to have to try and navigate through this wetland now. That's crazy. Oh, well. Well, I suppose I better tell you a couple of little survival tips that we use out here in the wilderness. Big jacket should be a waterproof one. I was not very clever. Waterproof jacket, a jersey underneath to keep warm, sometimes a scarf. And the most important thing is this. A big hood. Got to have a big hood. Keep the ears warm as well. Then you don't need to wear a beanie or anything like that. I think that's very, very, very important. The other thing is, is if you don't have a door on the side of your car, this is what you should do. To keep your shoe dry, you only need one. They sell them in singles. <laughs> but I can't have wet shoes because I only have one pair of shoes here and that's not nice. Oh, I better put my... Must plastic sock back on. They are reusable too. You can just pop them in the sink, give them a quick rinse, and ready to go again. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to find. Right, are you ready, Vim? <sighs> okay. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. If you see a crocodile, don't forget to scream. <laughs> That's the only version of Row, Row, Row Your Boat that I know. I can't, uh, I can't think of any other version. I actually can't remember the rest of the lyrics. But I know that one, the safari edition. Ooh, slipping and sliding. So we're just waiting for the animals to come out to us or the rain to stop, because at the moment I can't see anything on you. Well, I can see on that side for just a little bit. I've got... Maybe like 45 degrees that I can see things with. So hopefully there's not going to be any leopards or elephants on the right. Otherwise we'll be driving past them. <laughs> Mr. Public, you're asking if the muddy roads uh, will remind me of anything. Hmm, I wonder. Obviously the Masai Mara is very slippery. But though these roads are so tame in comparison. I mean, there it's just black cotton soil everywhere, most of the areas, which is not particularly nice. But here um, yeah, that's not really the case. This road's a bit... I mean, if 10 cars were to drive through here that, now, that wouldn't be too good. So luckily, they, I don't even think that that many people are out on safari. I don't know if the photographers will want, be wanting to get their cameras wet or anything like that. I wouldn't. Not the way it was pouring. It's starting to let up now. They'll probably, well, I would imagine a lot of the safari guests will probably come out in the next half an hour or so. But um, then I think it's going to be exciting. I always like it when the, once the rain stops. There's a drongo. Ooh, animals. No, 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 don't. Please be kind. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Birdie. I think you could hear the desperation in my voice for anything. So that there looks like a fork tailed drongo. Yep. I don't think you'll be able to hear it calling, unfortunately, because of the rain on the roof. It kind of stops all the air sounds. But it's very chirpy. There was a couple of other drongos actually looking around, because it could have been, I suppose it could have also been a, um, 
southern black flycatcher but that call gave it away instantly and of course southern black flycatcher doesn't have a red eye there's some cysticular shouting and we're in tandy sort of territory I'm just keeping out look out oh no okay interesting one um fluffy ossicones i suppose yes some of the animals and little critters out here oh another tortoise there she blows fiam and i are going to make as many boat jokes as we can on today's safari <laughs> so there's another one very lame okay we'll talk about that just in a minute from fluffy ossicones here we have a speaks hinge tortoise it looks like it's trying to drink and drive, which we, of course, don't condone. <laughs> you see that? Just stop. Then have a little sip. Obviously, it's drinking water, so it's fine. It's allowed to do that. But it looks like it's so thirsty that it just can't wait. Just wants to keep going. There we go. Absolutely desperate. That kind of looked like this tortoise has been in the desert for about three weeks and hasn't had a drink of water since. <laughs> it's stretching its neck right out. I wonder how long it's going to drink for. You can actually see when it's obviously swallowing, you can see the neck or the esophagus expanding slightly. I don't know if you noticed that on the neck. I don't know, not quite the esophagus. I assume that would be on the underside. Mmm. Was that just so refreshing? And it is. It's crystal clear, that water. So. I'm pretty sure they're so happy to drink the clean water. Although they don't mind the other stuff, but they would choose the good stuff when when it's available. Um, Thomas, yes, we are, we're definitely going to see a few creatures um, that we don't often get to see. So like the millipedes or the shongololos, as we call them, uh, which means to roll up which is exactly what they do when they're scared, will come out. And then, of course, the various tortoise species we can see. We might i don't think so though because i just get my hopes up and then i'm let down every single time it rains maybe some frogs or some toads i mean that would be just the ultimate gift for today just saying nature if you want to throw out a little african bullfrog or a bush felt rain frog and then some insect species vm if you pan to the left to the edge of that puddle of water there's a black thing moving so in line with the tortoise, uh, go up and to the left. No, so go, if you go onto the tortoise again and then go straight, uh, go across to the left. There you go. What beetle, what is that? There's a little beetle of sorts. Quite a large one. It looks like it's got some yellow. Is it a two-spot ground beetle, perhaps? We'll have to get a closer look in a minute. Oh, that tortoise has moved off, so that's okay. So there we go. There's some more animals that have been coming out. Whether it's come out to have a drink or if it's because its little burrow has perhaps been, um, I suppose, slightly flooded, just going back to Fluffy Arsicone's question, I think, yes, I think there are going to be some animals now that have, you know, found themselves a little cavity. They might not die, they just need to get out and then find another suitable hole. But yes, mongoose get flooded out often, hyenas, they don't always look so impressed. Anyways, I'm going to do a bit more investigating and find out what beetle this is. But off we go to a Ralph and we'll just see how he's having a great afternoon in the tent. <laughs> Well, everybody, it's lovely to do some investigating. And we've got a couple of jars here with all sorts of little things inside of them. And I'd like for us just to have a look at a, um, we call it a grillerige gogo, uh, if you could say that. A gogo. Try and say that. Well, we're going to go over here and we're going to have a look at this little gogo here. Now, the gogo underneath this microscope has got other little gogos moving around in it. And it looks like they're probably uh, assisting in decomposing this gogo or little creature. And you see that? That's absolutely amazing. And these are the kind of microscopic little creatures that we don't see with the naked eye. And as soon as you start looking with the with a microscope you can notice all the little things that are actually going on there now this is a baboon spider that has died and it was found and now we just use it to look nice and closely underneath the microscope 
And, well, we've discovered that it's busy being decomposed by these little uh, mites, or st I'm not quite sure exactly what those little things are, but they are microscopic. As you can see, uh, just from the hairs on the spider, which you can hardly see when you look with the naked eye as well. Now, I'm just going to move this spider around a little bit, and then you can see what I mean by all these little hairs. Now, a, a baboon spider is an araneomorph. It's one. It's a part of the more primitive group of spiders. They are purely ground dwellers, and they don't make nests. So they run uh, horizontally on the ground. They can run up walls and over windows and all of that vertically, but generally they're on the ground and they actively go and seek out their prey. Now, the other group is... No, and I said araneomorph. Araneomorphs are the ones that stay in webs. Mygalomorphs are the ones that we're looking at. Sorry, I made the mistake there. My bad. So this is a mygalomorph that we're looking at now, the baboon spider. And that's coming up a little bit closer to his head. And the araneomorphs being the web dwellers. And those are the ones like the big uh, golden orb web spiders uh, that sit vertically in their web and are useless on the ground so they can hardly crawl around at all as i just bring you up to the the sort of fang like section of his face so these uh, mygalomorphs literally go and actively seek out their prey whereas the araneomorphs stay in a web and they will wait for the prey to come to them and get caught in the web. Generally, they are vertical, but you do have uh, spiders like the uh, tropical tentweb spider who likes to go with negative geotaxis and hang upside down. He's quite a, um, a, a, an adrenaline junkie, I would say, a bit of a, a bungee jumper of the lot. Uh, Joe, I'm sorry that I'm making you itchy, uh, but it, it, I'm not a fan of spiders either, but it is still fascinating looking very closely at all the little hairs and things on this mygalomorph or baboon spider that likes running around on the ground. And they are family of the tarantula as well, and we find them in little burrows around the reserve, and they literally stay down in their hole and come out at night to hunt so and then they'll run around on the ground and actively seek out their prey as i said before as um in comparison to the araneomorphs who stay up in their webs so that is absolutely fascinating and i love just looking at these little things underneath the microscope but now my hair is standing up on end just looking at that um and not only because of the rain and trying to keep warm i'm pretty scared of these hoho like creatures and uh, i'll rather leave him just over there i think he's going to go back in his jar for now but while i do that off to taylor in the rain I have absolutely no idea what we are looking at. It is a bulb of sorts. I'm going to get out and go and fetch it, but I thought we'd have a quick look before I'd move the camera around. And something has obviously been eating it, as we can see. Was it a porcupine? Was it... I mean, an elephant we would see. I mean, an elephant probably crunched that in half. Could have been a warthog. It could have been so many different things that could be nibbling on this. I'm going to go and get it quickly, but I, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump out the car. It's a nightmare. I'm going to go out under the cover, do the limbo like this. <laughs> I'm not very good at the not very good at the limbo. I almost wore my slippers today. Almost. So it looks like all the bark and was peeled off the outer covering on the root look at it, it's all here so this is obviously done last night maybe maybe during the day but i think this is from a nocturnal critter let's bring it ha huh? <laughs> <My shoe. laughs> i'm coming now let me open up the door quickly i'm still here and just Doing one of those magic tricks again. Cable ties, these reusable ones are not easy to use. Hello again. This is really gross. This is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. It looks like something out of Harry Potter that was pulled out of... Who is it? Who does... Um... 
Here we go. Here's the Harry Potter fans. Who's the herbologist teacher? I can't remember. Remember that one episode? One episode. That one movie. <laughs> Where is that? I'm terrible. I'm really not good at quoting movies, but they pull these screaming things out of the, the pots. That's what this reminds me of. Anyways, it's very fleshy. It's Professor Sprout. Obviously, it's Professor Sprout that does this. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? But thanks, Luke. Did you Google it? So this is a very fleshy, very, very fleshy little bulb over here. It's massive. I mean, it's twice the size of my hand. Okay, well... I'm trying to stretch. Yeah, two two fists. And I have no idea what has actually eaten it. I'm going to go with a porcupine. I think that was what was nibbling on it at some point. But I don't know from what it is. It's got a, quite a bit of a stem here. It's quite thick. Little roots sprouting out at the top too. My hands are obviously filthy now, covered with sand. But I can't see any immediate digging. So I don't know how it's got it out on the road too. I wonder if an elephant maybe didn't pull out the ground and dropped it. <laughs> Paula, thank you. You've just saved my life. There we go. We've solved the Harry Potter mystery. It was Mrs. Sprout, and she was pulling out Mandrax. The man Mandrax? Yeah, those things. And they screamed blue murder. I don't know what you are, but this was very cool. Bye-bye, Mandrax. I believe my fashion sense is now trending on Twitter. I'm trying to work out how I'm going to get in the car again. This is all very technical. I was also trying to wipe my hands. Uh, you know what? I might not be the most fashionable person. Now I've dropped the... Oh, my goodness. No, <laughs> might not be the most fashionable person, but I'm... it's effective. It was a great day. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, I'm back in again. I'm plugged in. Oh, I'm a mess now. Let me pull my sock back on. I've now broken my slipper, my shoe. Oh well, we'll just carry on. Luke, did you just refer to my plastic thing as being very plasticish? Like very nice, like Kanye. Kanye West, I don't think would be wearing, would be cool to wearing anything like this. Okay, right, what are we going to find? VM, you said leopards. I was so hope so. We're going to try and find some leopards. We're going to go check some of Tundi's favorite spots to see if she's returned. And, well, I suppose while we do that, you can just hop on board with David. I am not dressed like this because I'm going to the moon or have I ever been there. But I'm sure you've been following what has been happening rains and rains and rains this morning I was talking to my friend in Kenya and he was telling me how they are suffering there because of the big rains and I made a joke to him why don't you send us some of the rain here and look what happened now this hood and the rain jacket I've been with it here for the last three weeks or so I've never put it on it's my first time I did not know it could come in handy but yes today it has worked magic and my friend manning the camera here Sebastian tells me do you see another from there oops okay do I stop there tells me this is not normal for this time of the year to have rains but well Mother Nature gives you what it wants and it is what it is and there we are with lots of rains but the Ellie's enjoying the thing eating and I don't think they have been really affected like me having two raincoats on because of rain and covering my feet and you have the panels on the side of the car you might Notice we'll not give you our normal best views for these animals, but if the rains, it seems, is subsiding now, it doesn't continue. I'm sure I'm going to roll them up and I'm going to give you some great views as usual. So we're going to move forward a little bit. We're going to do that. Allow me to move a little forward. That's why we apologize 
for the panel and the pillars, you'll see the poles on the side. It's just because as you left the camp, it was showing signs of rain and 10 minutes out. So we've got to give you the best we can. What do you think about that, Seb? Okay, boy? That should be good for you to enjoy those elephants there. We don't want to get this so close, we don't want to invade their space or so. But look on the skins after all the rain and I can tell you for a fact, as it has been raining, they have also been eating. And this looks to me like a breeding herd. And knowing the amount of food they want to keep holding and maintain that body frame, I do not think the rain would stop them from eating. And I'm sure occasionally you're going, you're seeing some drops just coming up down as the rain is subsiding and maybe slowing down. Luckily, it might stop. Thank you very much, all of you out there. And please celebrate with us. We have been celebrating the rain. And now let's also celebrate the Ellis. I'm not sure what's up there with those two. And that one, is it a standoff there? That female was not happy with that youngster. I do not know what the youngster might have done. And it was reprimanded. And I think it has been put in check. You might think these Ellies have been swimming, but, you know, they have been out there just, you know, celebrating and enjoying the rain just like us. And Catherine, you're asking if the elephants enjoy the rain, and I would say yes, they have no issues or no worries. With, I have never seen, Catherine, an elephant sheltering because of the rain, unless they have very, very young babies, very young calves, and maybe they would try and give them some cover. But what would happen, they would put the babies just under their bellies and shelter them from a heavy rain. So Catherine, I don't think the rain really bothers the Ellies a lot. Catherine, I hope you're enjoying this view of elephants here. Aiden, how are you? And very good to hear a question from you again today. And you're asking if elephants have any hair. I think the only hair I would look at an elephant or any fur, unless you look on their tails or the eyelashes, elephants do not have any hair. If you look at that skin, it's very rough, very rugged, very wrinkled, and they may not have hair or fur, as you'd see in the cats like lions Operators, look at that. Well done, Seb. If you call any hair on elephants, that's what I'd call hair. But that is very, very tough to like bristles or like wires. Very, very tough. And maybe not hair per se. Aiden, I always like hearing your questions. And to all of you, don't forget to send us your questions on Twitter, hashtag Safari Life, or you can follow us on, on a YouTube chat. It's a very interactive safari drive we do, and you keep us engaged. Sorry, Lucas, Mr. Public would like to know what? Mr. Public, you'd like to know if we get other herds apart from breeding herds. Yes, you'll get once once the boys, once the youngsters, the males mature, sometimes at the age of 10, 12, the females and more so the matriarch will always show them the door and, you know, get out of the breeding herd, go get yourself a job, go get yourself a wife and go have a living. And you'll see many males grouped together. So apart from breeding hearts, Mr. Public, you'd also see what you'd call a bachelor herd. Hello. How has the rain been? Good looking girl. 
Are you pregnant or are you just big? So that shows you how comfortable the Ellis are. If you treat them well, they give you the same. And she walks pretty close to where we are. And it's like a nice family. If you go to the right step there, you can see that the beautiful eye. You see the eyelashes, Aiden, that I was talking about before. So should you call hair of an elephant, and that's not hair per se, you can see the great work Sebastian is doing, showing us that beautiful eye as she feeds there. Mr. Public, you're asking how maybe the air would smell before or after the rain. And I think now I'm smelling nothing but freshness. It all smells fresh and very clean air. And I would want or would like to be out here as long as possible, Mr. Public. And it's just smelling lovely. All the dust that could have been on the leaves also has been washed down. And just smelling lovely and not any smell of dust is a pure clean fresh air rain seems to be coming back unless you can hear that in the background there falling on our roof but either way we are still in business Love Ark, you're asking how far maybe the elephant vocalization will go. And very big out in matriarch. If they rumble, that would even go to three, five kilometers. I'll guess three to five kilometers, but that would be a guess. I do not know for a fact, but I would say three to five kilometers, you'd comfortably hear them. And especially so when they trumpet, if they're not happy by a situation and the trumpet, should they see, for example, a predator and they're trying to fight it off, they have known, apart from physically dealing with predators, the sound they make when they trumpet, it is so large and so huge. Are you enjoying the rain, beautiful cow? Lovely to see Ellis coming so, so close. You can see the foot there and the toes. And from a huge mammal, we'll go to a feathered friend somewhere in the bush. We are somewhere in the bush. We've got a little raptor that's desperately trying to dry its feathers out at the moment. But I don't know what juvenile it is. It's very speckled. Very, very speckled. It's quite small. I'd say about the size of a lizard buzzard, somewhere around there. It seems to be more sort of brown mottling. I don't know what it is. I'm trying to think what it could be, but there are some birding experts of, out there. Maybe one of you could help us. What about the... It's got a barring on the chest, so what about a dark chanting gossel? No, not an immature. Just having a look at my bird app. That sort of white on its eyebrows is pretty distinctive. I know that the lizard buzzard has a little bit of it. What does the juvenile look like? No, I don't have any pictures of juveniles on my app. I'd have to Google some. But that's very cool. It's drying its feathers out at the moment. Not very impressed with the rain. If any of you do know exactly what your little raptor this could be, hashtag Safari Live. Let us know. Ralph, if you know what it is, chime in. What about a... A kestrel? Nah. It's very small. It's a petite little bird. Maybe it's smaller than a lizard buzzard. I don't know. It doesn't look like an adult to me, however. It definitely looks like a juvenile. But, um, yes, that mottled feathering, feather, feathering doesn't help. Very cool, though. What about a juvenile greater kestrel? Yeah. No, it's got a lot of white on it. Uh, Rolf is also going to have a look now and see if he can figure it out. 
get some homework for the tent, but that's quite cool. So, uh, oh, it's holding its wing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got excited. It was pretty amazing the way it was sort of just standing there with its wings open, trying to <clears throat> dry off those feathers, uh, especially the ones or the primaries and the secondaries. You need to be nice and dry, otherwise you're going to struggle to fly quite a bit. But quite cool. Interesting to see what it turns out to be. Very nice. Okay, Wendy, we've only got like maybe an hour and a half left of the show. Wendy, I think we can't be... Uh, ugly ugly to her today i'm gonna have, she have to be nice to her because she might break on us again because we're now losing power maybe if i click as if she was a horse she'd respond better <clears throat> okay so we're coming up to the first area that tandy likes to hang about where we always find her tracks we've had so many sightings of her around here Remember that one time she climbed onto that beautiful horizontal branch? I think it was on a fallen African wattle. And she just stood there and then she even groomed her paws. She was showing off how good her balance is. That was over here. So we're on central. We'll carry on all the way to Cheetah Cut Line and just see if, if she perhaps hasn't been moving around. And at least if she did walk there, the sand is quite soft. So she should theoretically sink into that sand. And yes, even though with all the rain, I think we might get a, a sight a slight indentation of her paw prints, but I suppose we'll have to, we'll find out in a minute if we don't find any or not. Bim, if we're going to see a leopard, which leopard do you think we're going to see? <clears throat> Tandy. Tandy. Bim says Tandy. Or, or Tingana. Who would you like to see out of the two more? I Tandy, because you saw Tingana yesterday. Bim is going on holiday. And if all goes to plan, Vian will be going to Kenya. So that means we might not be seeing him for a little while. Hey, Vian? But I bet you're excited to see all the lions. And the serval. The servals. Vian thoroughly enjoyed the servals. Remember that amazing sighting we had, Vian? The one that I just cannot stop talking about, the hyena serval sighting. Vian was with me. It was amazing. It was super cool. Okay, I'm starting to hear some more birds chattering. Oh, Luke would like me to share what was amazing about it. For those of you that haven't heard this story 377 times, I'll say it for, oh, well, I'll tell you. We can just go and watch it. You can actually search it. I think it's a Safari Lab highlight or something like that. So maybe go check the YouTube uh, uh, channel. And I'm sure there will be an archive somewhere in there you can look for it. And basically what would happen was the server would, like popped out in front of us in the grass and we thought it was going to run away. We thought it was hiding from the hyenas. It wasn't. It was doing the complete opposite. It was like hissing and snarling at the hyenas and went closer and eventually, in, well, insisted that it fed on the wildebeest carcass which the hyenas were eating. And it did. Ate on the carcass the hyenas left. <laughs> it was amazing. Never seen anything like it. Oh, also that beetle. Now, I couldn't really show you, unfortunately, because of the, the roofs and all the covers. That's why I, I didn't end up showing you. I went closer to it, and it was covered in sand, and I couldn't really see what it was. So I used my flap, and I dripped water on it. And it actually didn't have any colors on it. It was completely black. So I think it may have been a, to a type of talk talky beetle. But it had um, quite a big body, and then very and quite, quite a round beetle, and a round head too. Smooth shell. I'm wondering if it wasn't a talk talky beetle. Should be cool because I haven't seen one of those out here for a while. It's getting cold now. Okay. Okay. Kim, you've suggested that perhaps that bird we we had uh, drying its feathers could have been a juvenile little sparrowhawk. Yes, it most certainly could have. We'll have a look at some point. I'm not going to whip out any mobile devices. Oh, my book is getting wet. This is why I cannot have nice things. Oh, Maurice. Look who I brought out on a cold, rainy day for entertainment. Maurice. He's just got a drip of water on his head now. <laughs> Luke had actually thought I'd lost Maurice. Luke, if I had lost Maurice, Rebecca would have had my head and I'd be not be working. I would have been in so much trouble. Maurice, are you freezing? Maurice needs to winter clothes. Can anybody suggest what I'm going to make for Maurice for winter? Because I have no idea. Yeah. A gown? Oh, that's such a good idea, VM. A gown with slippers. 
A red gown. Hugh Hefner gown. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. We shall make Maurice a gown. I'm going to have to ask somebody that can sew to make it for me. Anyways, off you go to David to see if he's having any more luck than we are. Well, elephant puppets making them much warmer. Here I have the two elephants. They do not need any coat with them, no hoods on their heads, and just tearing all the thorn trees, feeding, and that way they're keeping warm. As the raindrops just bangs and hits their bodies and splashing down, and saying we have our business and our business is to eat and maintain our big body frames and the rains do not worry us at all. When the rains come it changes or it comes with so many dynamics because what would happen not many animals you now see going to the water ponds or flood ponds or going to watering holes to drink and Ellis are classical examples if they would be here eating and getting all the moisture on the bush willows they're feeding on and the grass, chances are they may opt not to go for a drink as frequently as they normally do. That's how things play out when rains come. Sorry Jennifer, what about what? I hope we got the question of uh, Jennifer Cross. Is this asking the average size of an elephant here? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, let's see. Um, I don't know what shape Jennifer we are going to give that here. Do we call it an obtuse triangle or do we say it's kind of a rectangle? And if it's a rectangle, say, or squarish more or less, not exactly a square and say one side could be three feet, another side could be six feet. If you've got a triangle, it will be half times the base area, maybe three times two, six divided by two, maybe three square feet, I would say. But that's just a quick calculation. I would say it could be about three square feet. Jennifer, what do you think? That's my quick calculation, and could be about three square feet as the size of an ear. But of course it depends on the size of an elephant. Some have much bigger ears than what you see there. And what's eating now is what we call a buffalo thorn bush. And when I say thorn, it's because it has very sharp thorns, in fact spines. And how these alleys are able to break and survive those thorns, it's really something. Gemma, how are you today? And I'm sure you're asking whether there are any fruit for the Ellie's to eat this time around, I think is winter here in South Africa. And every one my ruler tree I've been looking at, I haven't seen a single fruit. And I do not know what other fruits they'll be going for, if anything, I would guess, unless they go for the berries, say of the Natal or the Magic Nguares. I do not think there could be any other fruit around this time. What do you think, Seb? Any fruit this time around for the year? Mm, no, not really now. Not in winter. It's more in summer. Well, Gemma Sebastian also thinks this time around, no, until summertime. And I haven't seen any fruit all the drives have been making. If anything, just the magic of the Natal Nguare. The magic Nguare of the Natal Nguare. Uh, berries they would be eating because there are lots of them at the moment and they're ripe and they have seen them eating the berries from the nguari trees Ravinda how are you today and I hope your question is the biggest task I've ever come across and it was one that was about 18 feet, 18 feet, and that was quite an issue. I'm not sure where they got it from, but it was about 18 feet. That was a very, very long task, and it was a place found north of north of Kenya.
I do not know whether the tusks of elephants have been shrinking or they have been coming smaller with time. Hello, girl. We truly apologize for the panel there. We can't see it very well, but we are going to reposition and give you a better view, Ravinda, of this Alice and maybe try to estimate because what you see, the size of an elephant's tusk, is what is out there. But some of them go further in there to another three feet. And Taylor is still in love with tortoises as we reposition. Another one, BM and I have just decided that today we're going to have a tortoise off, a tort off. Have, that doesn't work, but we'll think of something catchy along the way. <laughs> the idea was there. Anyway, so this is a leopard tortoise again, and this is tortoise number three for all of you. However, it is tortoise number five for VM and I. So we're going to try and put as many tortoises as we can on screen green and started well a com not a competition but we're just going to see when on these rainy days how many we can get and we'll have a record at some point and hopefully it just keeps getting better and better but it has to be like a bird challenge it has to be seen while live so here we go number three so we'll be stopping at all of the tortoises today i hope you're excited very nice okay tortoise there's no water for you to drink yeah you're gonna have to go further along the road or perhaps it's already come for a drink. Bye bye. Pradeep, my friend, who's only six, I haven't heard from you in such a long time. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Why have you not been asking me questions? Now, Pradeep, mm, squirrels have so much fun when it's raining. I think that they are just hiding in their holes. Because you know that they like live in those rotten holes, or they were maybe rotten at one point, in the branches of the tree or in the trunk of the tree. I think they all cuddle up. I think they make a Christmas bed. So, top, we, what we call a Christmas bed in South Africa is basically all mattresses put together, and you all bring your blankets and you all just sit together. I think they do that in their little hidey hole. I think. What else? Oh no, okay, well pretty I'll well, try and find you a squirrel and we can see what it does on a rainy day. Apparently an elephant has toppled down. We got a very interesting sighting here and we got some two youngsters who have been taking a mud bath there and they're very closely monitored either by the mother or one of the aunties. So the two of them, they are just picking mud and splashing on their bodies, including the fully or the big cow there, and they rolled down and they were all on top of each other. Just watch that. So the mother or the big cow there is digging the mud for them and then you know she is also benefiting from the same and throwing it on her back to cover herself and because it's wet it's gonna cement very nicely on the skin and sometimes elephants have done that when they get dry that helps to protect their skin it's kind of a sunscreen and all the rain that has been falling on their bodies now they're wet and able to get now the wet mud also and just throw it over their bodies. Look at the young one there. It's definitely a young boy and boys being boys. Tusks slowly coming out. I might have mentioned this before that Ellie's are my favorite animals to watch because you could be here, have your lunch and keep here, have your dinner if they don't move and don't close or wink or close your eye for a minute. <laughs> what is he trying to do? Holding, I'm not sure that's the mother there, but he's definitely a boy. And he is having moment of his life, eh? <laughs> We'll see if the other one will come and join. I think it was a first cousin who was just behind it there, but his own mud bath, I would guess, they are doing here. Picking the mud, 
the mother on the fully grown cow is digging and throwing it on his body. The big cow doing the same and we have maybe one of the cows is coming in. This is great fun, eh? I'll always thank the elephants for the entertainment they give us, eh? Are you struggling to rise up? You can do it. Kajit, you are asking how much water do they need daily? And that varies, and there are a number of factors that would come in to determine how much they would take in a day. And number one would be, of course, the size of an elephant, the age of an elephant, and the availability, what type of food is there. But you have seen them some taking 60 or 80 gallons of water in a day. 60 or 80 gallons of water in a day. Well, this is not leaving the mud bath as yet. And without the rains coming now, they might not take as much water because most of the food they're having is wet and is full of moisture and the leaves are also holding water. And they might walk along the road, have a few sips of water as they move along. And what a show, eh? Right, Taylor, tell us what you got for us now. Just stealing you away from David very quickly to add tortoise number four to our count, tortoise number six for VM&I, as we had a few off screen, but another speaks hinge tortoise. Hmm, very cool, very dark in color. Also, I'm not sure where it's going to have a drink, but we'll let it carry on its way, crossing the road. Might just have to start the car like this. No, not going fast enough. <laughs> Waiting. Okay, awesome. My bye speaks hinge tortoise is on its way. We actually did have some elephants here, but they have now moved into the thicket. They're not as fun as the elephants that David had. Those ones sound cool. These guys just seem to be very relaxed and feeding at the moment. We'll see if we can get a decent view of of one. Minamino, I think I heard correctly about the question was about something about what makes the tortoise's shell so hard. I just assume it's calcium that helps with that. Maybe some phosphorus too. I don't know what else, chem what other chemicals would help with the hardening of a tortoise shell, but I'm pretty sure it's all made up of maybe some keratin, a variety of things, but calcium. And but but calcium. Oh, there's an elephant. Would definitely be helping with the strengthening of any bones. Anything like that? Why are the shells not made out of bone? I don't know what nonsense I'm talking today. I'm, I'm actually just going to watch what this car does because I'm in her way, and she's got a bit of a swagger to her. Hi, girl. You're going to go off there and feed on that silver class leaf. Thank you very much. No, just touching it, trying to trick me. I fell for that trap. Did you see how I walked straight into it? Hello, big girl. Let's watch her. There's a whole, whole group of them around here. Let's see if she's sort of doing this displacement behavior where she's just pretending to feed. She's just touching vegetation. Hello, girl. It's okay. So not actually feeding. I'm just going to watch her. Hello, big girl. There we go. Thank you. You look like you've had a great time in the sand today. Just easing as she put a little bit of something in her mouth. And as long as you don't make any serious sudden movements, it's okay. She'll be fine. Just looking at us, movement of the camera. She may have seen that little one trotting on after. <laughs> Not as brave. Going a little bit of a wider berth. It's okay, little one. Smelling us. We've got a few more. That one's probably maybe an older sibling. I'm sorry, I'm just sitting and watching them. Oh, yeah, you, you're brave, aren't you? You're going to come right up to the car. 
Hello. Now, a young elephant like this, a little bit older than the one we just saw, is of course very curious. Hello. Yes. Just having a look at us. That's so cool. <laughs> That's really amazing when things like that happen. Just having a look. Quite curious. Now, um, not um, yes, was what I was supposed to say, Bobby. I think that lightning and thunder does frighten elephants a little bit. I've seen them stampeding around during a thunderstorm once, but it was a really, really terrible electrical storm. I don't think that they enjoy it so much. They're obviously quite used to it because they can't just go and, you know, hide themselves away in a house, you know, c cuddle under the duvet. I can't do anything like that, so I'm sure it does frighten them every now and then. Now that elephant is playing in a puddle of mud, puddle of water, maybe mud now, as it's been stirred up quite a bit. Oh yes, okay. David is in the sighting. This is David's sighting. I've just stolen some of the elephants from him. Ha 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 ha. Can't have the elephants all to you yourself. If it's an elephant, I'll come through and I'll steal that sighting quickly. And no, I'm just teasing. Let's see. This one is obviously oozing confidence. See as it's raising its head. Just slightly. It's like a young boy. Just going, no, I'm not really interested in you. I'm just actually having a little smell over here. It's almost doing exactly what that cow did to us. See, acknowledging us. Yes. Oh, I really love it when things like this happen. <laughs> of course, you've got to dig on that one, then we can't see. That's just a pole, of course, for the roof. Come on, take a few steps. <laughs> Hello, little cheeky elephant. Off you go, big boy. Yes, you were so terrifying. Right, well, that was an amazing experience. I'm, hopefully you enjoyed it just as much as I did. I'm going to see if I can find David along the way. Off you go to Ralph and see, well, if his coffee, if he's meant well, actually, have you got another coffee, Ralph? Well, Taylor, I haven't been making coffee or making myself comfortable at all. What I've been trying to do is, is trying to identify that bird that you spotted a little bit earlier. And obviously, just from this picture here, we're looking at the video of Safari Live. I've frozen it there. Um, and I'm, it's really difficult to see from just that picture because now there's a few birds that I'm working through. Uh, one of them being the African goshawk that we're looking at here, but he is slightly larger than the one I think that we had on the on the branch there, Taylor. But the barring down the chest and on the tail fits and also that little mask that seemed for me to be around the eye or just from the gape of the bull, uh, a little bit of a mask. But as I say, quite difficult um, from that particular picture. Now, the second one that I've been looking at is the lizard buzzard. Uh, lizard buzzard, for me, the right kind of size. Uh, it's a lot smaller than the African goshawk, so for me, uh, much better size. The only problem that I find here is that we've got this bib, like, uh, uh, you know, coloration coming from the head all the way down onto the chest. And then we don't have the barring on the tail. So the right size and shape, but I'm still thinking that, uh, and this is only my thought, I'm thinking that the shikra or the little banded goshawk was the bird that we were actually looking at. But it's... um. It's not confirmed. I just think because of that, that mask that he's got on, the banding going down, and the banding on the tail, plus the perfect type of size. So I think that that is the one that we were looking at. But uh, uh, it was really not the greatest of pictures, especially with the, with the rain. Rocky, a black-shouldered kite, is very white on the chest. Uh, it doesn't have that banding like it does have there. And the shape was just not right for a black-shouldered kite. I know a black-shouldered kite very well. But um, anyway, let's keep the debate open. You can prove me wrong. But for now, I'm going with that little banded goshawk 
or the Shikra. Now, I just wanted to show you a little bit about uh, a, a, a quick overview map of where we are in the Sabi Sands. And then I just want to show you the general temperature and rainfall that we have each year. Just so that you get an idea of why we're all surprised a little bit at this time of year, why we are getting such a big uh, rainstorm. Now, obviously, we just want to check here on the African continent. That's South Africa right down at the bottom there that uh, Craig is showing you. And if we then go on to South Africa, which is superimposed there, we are right up in the northeastern corner is the Kruger National Park. And then going on to the Kruger National Park, we're right down sort of south uh, westerly of the Kruger National Park itself. So that's exactly where we are. And in terms of the average rainfall and temperatures that we get here, now, this would be in the winter months, sort of around 20 to 25 degrees, um, dropping down just below 10 degrees in uh, June, July, and going up towards the 68 degrees um, uh, in, uh, in Fahrenheit. So it's actually a rather uh, warm um, uh, climate altogether. But if we look at the rainfall, we can see how it's almost exactly the same from uh, summer, where we have quite high rainfall heading around that 100 millimeters, or uh, you could probably say about four or five inches. And as it goes, all the months with an R, January, February, March, April, May, it really drops down to little to zero. June, July, we have little to zero rainfall. August and only once we hit September again, another month with an R in it, October, November, December, well, then the averages increase once more. So you can see that this type of rain, and it's quite substantial, it's uh, very uh, unusual for this time of year. And uh, very interesting to see uh, that, um, that that's exactly the kind of um, uh, climate and rainfall and all of that that we get at this particular time of year. So it's, it's actually unusual for us also to see so many reptiles that are out as well. And that's why they're obviously all filling their boots, getting the water that they want. And those animals, the elephants, that really love it when it's wet, when it's raining. Well, let's go to David and see how much fun they're having. I mean, the rains are coming back and these elephants, especially the youngsters, don't look bothered at all. You can see the drops falling down from the sky and from the clouds and we thought rains might have subsided, but mm, I say that too soon. But these alleys are like, this is perfect weather for us to get lots of sunscreen on our bodies and they're doing all what they need to do to keep themselves going. Taylor got something interesting. My ponytail, which I'm going to have to do wash at some point because it doesn't like the rain. We had a squirrel and the squirrel, oh, please, Wendy, please. Let me try that again. We had a squirrel for Pradeep who was watching. And I was going to show you what squirrels did for fun, but it didn't want to hang around. It didn't want to wait for you. And that's why you mustn't be friends with the squirrels, Pradeep, because they lie. They tell lots of stories in the bush. They're the gossipers. And then they don't want to hang around and uh, show themselves when I want to show you squirrels. And I think you've asked me about squirrels before. And I said I would try and find you one, and I didn't. And then we'll find another, though. I think we're going to find lots of them sitting up in the trees. It's starting to rain again, Evian. It's not great. Put a little rain cover on the monitor. Let me check up in these trees for the squirrel quickly. No, but I think we're going to find another tortoise. What do you hear on this road? Like this is going to be a good tortoise road. Nothing just yet. And while I'm on these roads, I'm so terrified that I'm going to drive over one. So I must make sure that I check carefully. I don't go racing through any puddles. Or a leopard could just walk out. 
I don't think I've ever been on the on high alert for tortoises before. Like, well, not like this. What do you think, VM? I know that was gonna. Hmm. Let's just check. These main roads are quite good because they gather big pools of water. We keep searching. Bring on the frogs. Frogs will be now. Ah, uh, thank you. I'll keep trying. Pleasure. I'll keep trying for pretty. No problem. We'll keep on searching. I'm sure eventually. <gasps> it was a bird that I was looking for for a while, but it seems as though the signal gremlins try trying to get me. So back you go to David, who I'm sure is still with the elephants. These alleys have given me a wonderful show today, and I got hard just leaving from where we are and heading to a different direction. Let's see what we can do with the best situation we have with the rain covers on there. And they're the ones who are just wallowing and doing a bit of mud bath a few minutes ago. And not bothered by the rain, as I said earlier. Keep feeding, keep moving as is typical of Ellis. grab what they want and the direction they're going to this small little water pan there i'm not sure there's a starlings in front of them yeah there's a starlings the blue bats you see they are very good seb i don't know if you can hear that rumbling and trumpeting of ellis i'm not sure look you can hear that There could be a bit of a scuffle in the small hut we left it behind us. Actually, the true elephants are born blind. I haven't heard of that. And I would say elephants are born with their eyes open and they can see immediately they're born. I would really also wish to confirm the same, but I have never heard of elephants being born blind unlike you know the cubs of say leopards or lions that are born blind and they open their eyes after a few days elephants i think they born with their eyes open and they can see immediately but i'd be more than happy to confirm the same so we'll follow up this ellis and maybe if we see them look a young one very closely and find out how their eyes look like and try to figure out when they're born are they born blind or they are born with their eyes seeing? I would guess they are not born blind. That's my thinking. As much as I said, I'd be more than happy to confirm with the other guides, but I think they are born with their eyes opened and not blind. Right, they have taken a different turn and we're also thinking where could the cats have gone? But with this kind of rain, they tend to tuck in more. Cats in general will not like the rain and unless you go say under a cliff or a big copy, a big rock or under some nice drainage line that has good cover, it could be difficult to see them. Ronald, you're asking if lions and leopards like the rain just like the alleys. Not at all, not at all, unless they would want to take an advantage of a situation of when it's raining and they'll know say their prey for example wildebeest or zebras are all grouped together sheltering themselves from the rain that time they have been known to sneak to the prey and they'll walk and be rained on because they have a mission and they want some food but in general they will not do that and leopards <coughs> excuse me and the lions of course and the cheetahs because of the amount of fur they got on their bodies they soak so much water they would not want to be out in the rain and as an impala is coming ahead of us i think taylor got something bigger than that 
We've got something incredible. We've got a huge kudu bull. We don't have just one. We've got two that are tailing a, a group of females. There goes one. So I'm just watching to see what's going on here, trying to figure out. There's a big bull in there. You may have seen his horns. He's chasing them around. But I wonder if this other fellow is going to be not so impressed with him because he's not small either. Should we go forward, Vim? I think there might be a gap. Lots of young calves. Let's see. Shoo, he's big. Please don't break, Wendy. Please don't break. Okay. Uh, Tom, maybe. No, he's huge. I'm trying to get a gap. He keeps disappearing. Um. Some horns. I'm going to keep going back because there's some youngsters. Oh, he's he is VM holding. He's chasing that other male. Oh, he's so grumpy. He just chased this one that's disappearing now. Chased the one that's behind us. There he goes. That was so cool. And now. I don't think I've ever seen kudu bulls fighting properly. I've seen them sort of sparring and playing around with one another. But it must be incredible to witness animals of that size and with such long horns too to fight properly. Often what happens is that because those are spiraled horns, they interlock. And they, will, they can both end up dying if they get stuck together. I'm just going to see if I can figure out where they've gone now. It's not helping because the vegetation's obviously thick. There he goes. Oh, must be a cow coming into estrus. Maybe she's a bit late. The others seem to have already had their youngsters. Let's have a look. No. Oh, it's a pity that we can't see it well, have you? Oh, well. It's just one of those things. This vegetation is so dense, but w winter would be very cool. Pity they've now gone quite far back. Guide monkey he was. He was massive. Both of them were really, really big. The first one we saw was the contender that got chased out. And I thought, that's a, that's a beautiful kudu. And then we come around the corner and there's another one and he's even bigger. His splay was so much wider as well. That was stunning. It's a pity it wasn't very open, but you can see it's just as we're driving here. It goes down into a big drainage system. Very, very thick. We've actually tried to navigate through here a number of times. We're almost in the area where we were walking this morning. We're about to, if we carry on going down a little bit further and into the next dip, we'll eventually get to where that porcupine uh, burrow was that we had a look at on the Sunrise Safari during bushwalk. But uh, we won't be able to go in there now. But we're going to head towards Treehouse Dam and just have a little scratch around there, see what's happening that side. And then I think we'll go to the far west. There's a bunting. Can you see VM through here on these dead trees? See between those two silver cluster leaves? So you've got to turn. There's a dead tree, little dead tree in the middle. Uh, go up to your right. There we go. You got it. There you go. A little golden breasted bunting. A very pretty bird to see. Also, nice dramatic colors against the very moody sky, don't you think? Very easy to spot, I find. They almost look like they've got a helmet on with those three sort of black stripes, one below the eye, one above the eye, and one sort of on the top of the head with the white in between. The chagras have kind of got something similar to, but they're just much, a much bigger bird and a little bit more robust. And they don't, of course, have either a rufous or well, cinnamon-colored breast or a golden breast. So that's quite cool. Nice bird to see. See, this kind of weather is really good for birding. Okay, so Rolf has managed to find a couple of goodies. I wonder where he's picked up whatever he's got under the microscope. Well, look at this, everybody, and I know that this might scare some people because, uh, well, this little critter that we are looking at just at the end of its stinger does make lots of people quite scared. Now, I'm just having a very close look at it because uh, we can see from this scorpion that over here, this is called the telson, and this is where the venom is actually housed and later would be in, uh, delivered through this little uh, stinger over there. So 
Scorpions are not poisonous. Remember, poison is ingested. They are venomous because it's injected. So this is what would uh, be stinging you if you had to uh, come too close to the scorpion or if he climbed into your bed and you rolled on it. And, um, well, I do want to show you the rest of him, which I've got here on the table with us. So we are going to just leave that little um, stinger and now we're having a look at a scorpion and the reason why I want to show you a scorpion is because it's one of the little creatures that can potentially come out after we have rains like this it seems a lot of them go dormant just below the surface of the soil some in little burrows some in holes in trees etc and as soon as there's a little bit of moisture which trickles through to them through a significant amount of rain then they come out of their burrows and they start looking for food once more we've got three different groups of scorpions this one with the very big pincers over there and as you can see over there as well very big pincers and the stinger that we looked at has broken off and that's why i had it underneath the microscope but this is part of the scorpioni day the scorpioni day have very big pincers and a rather small uh, stinger that that's why I was putting it underneath the microscope so their major defense is through grabbing things with their with their pincers there but they also use those pincers for burrowing into both trees into bark and into the soil and all sorts of things like that so very important big stinger big big pincers like that small stinger scorpioni day if they have reasonably large pincers but uh, uh, also a reasonably large uh, stinger that's your ishniri day the dangerous scorpions are part of the boothy day family where they've got very small pincers and massive stingers and the talson ready to deliver a massive amount of venom so those are the ones that we do need to be careful of and the only one that we do have in south africa that that is potentially dangerous uh, and could uh, theoretically kill somebody is the transvaal thick-tailed scorpion the boothy day and also once we go up uh, into the Namib Desert, we have the Paraboothy Day, which are extremely dangerous and can give you heart palpitations, can cause heart attacks, especially to the elderly and the young. That's so interesting. Now, Ravinda, what is inside the stinger is in fact a protein um, that uh, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not a chemist and I'm not uh, that great with chemistry, but I do know that it's a protein um, that uh, d once delivered, um, depending on what kind of venom that you have, you know, snakes have different kinds of venom. But with scorpions, they do generally have more of a cytotoxin mixed with a neurotoxin. So you're going to have a bit of both uh, swelling at the site, but also that tingling uh, uh, feeling where every time your heart pumps, you're going to feel that moving up and down your arm. It is can be seriously painful. I've been stung by a scorpion a few times, and I know a friend of mine in, in the skydiving club in Swakopmund in Namibia, uh, he was dealing with all the parachutes and he put his jacket down and uh, when he went to go and pick his jacket up he put his jacket on and he put his hands in his pockets like this and he felt the sting so he took his hand out and he was like what's going on and so he put his hand in again and it stung him again i tell you it got him three times before he took his jacket off and threw it like this and the scorpion fell out he was a real sucker for punishment but that's the kind of uh, uh, thing that you do need to realize when you live out in the bush here yeah, me when i put my my jersey down uh, or my shoes i give it once twice three times shake with my shoes i always hit the bottom of my shoe out before i gingerly put my hand inside to feel if there's anything hiding because things like scorpions they like to go and hide in little places like that and wait for something to come past that they can sting now kaya uh, as i said it's mostly to do with the pincers versus the stinger not in fact the size of the scorpion Obviously, 
the bigger the scorpion, the more potential he's got for more venom. Now, those padded Boothidae uh, scorpions that we get in Namibia, they probably double that size. So almost the size of my hand. And the stinger is literally lying on top of its head because it's so full of venom. It must be very heavy. It's like almost like an elephant carrying those massive tusks around all day. So that stinger is hanging like this. And if you look close, you can actually see the venom that's dripping out of that little stinger. It is very scary and I've had to keep uh, my guests safe and warn them about scorpions, especially inside their tents regularly when I take people camping on our safaris through the desert especially. That's where we find a lot of them, but I'm sure that we're going to find a few around camp tonight, especially after the, this little uh, sprinkling of rain. It's always when they come out. Now, Magic Dragon Wizard, we've got all the different uh, groupings of scorpions here in Juma. We've got the burrowing scorpions or the Scorpionidae, and I'm talking family of scorpions. So we've probably got more than 20 species if we had to actually look quite closely. So we've got the Scorpionidae, we've got the Ishmeridae, which is uh, uh, relatively the same size pincers versus the stinger, and we've also got those Transvaal thick-tailed uh, scorpions, part of the Boothidae family, which are the real ones that we need to be careful of. But remember, these animals aren't coming out and, well, I say animals, uh, these uh, arthropods, which are part of the animals, are not coming out looking and chasing us down to come and kill us. Neither are the snakes, neither are the elephants. They're just there doing their thing. If we as humans do the wrong thing, get in the way or stand on them, or, you know, that's when we might get stung, etc. David, I've never eaten a scorpion. I know in certain places, especially like Asian countries, etc., they do cook scorpions. I've never tasted one myself. I don't know if it would taste like a lobster or a crab, but my best get guess would be that it tastes closer to a lobster or a rock lobster being like a crayfish, just because of its shape. But um, as I say, never tasted one. I know animals that do taste them are like the mongoose, and they very often quickly bite off the stinger, and then you can go for it because then it's got no more defense. Only those reasonably small pincers, but they're generally not that sore, especially not as hard as a crab. Um, but uh, I also know people that pick scorpions up, they always grab it by the tail. And so once you've got that tail, it's like grabbing a snake uh, by the mouth and, and holding its fangs, uh, then it's, it's defense are gone so uh, it, it, it is you can handle them I wouldn't recommend it now I do know that it was just recently as well that one of these crawled into, I think, into Taylor's bed. And I think she might have got bitten. So let's go to her and hear her story on that. I don't think I had a scorpion in my bed. I don't ever want a scorpion in my bed. So what actually happened was we were watching a movie and I was sitting on the floor. Mistake number one. And I felt something crawling up my leg and I was wearing shorts. So I just, well, gently tried to shoo it off me because it was dark and I couldn't see what was crawling on me. Well, in response, I got a zap that felt like a wasp sting times 10. And then I quickly scrambled for my torch, put it on, and noticed on the floor next to me was a scorpion looking very angry. Tail up, like, ah! Anyways, it turned out it was a little Europlecti scorpion. I did share a picture of it, I think, on Twitter at some point, but it happened quite a while ago, about six weeks ago? Maybe even longer, maybe like eight weeks ago now. I think it was on the first week that I was back at work. And it's because it's stung me on the leg. My goodness, it shot a horrible pain down to my toes and then right up, sort of up my side as well. And it lasted for about 20 minutes, half an hour. I had a headache. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't unbearable. It just wasn't very nice at all. And then I was fine. The bite, or the bite, the sting site was very sensitive though. Like if I wore long, I couldn't wear long pants. And when it touched the seat, it would burn. Like if it touched anything, it would burn. It felt like there were like lots of little prickly hairs, uh, like little cactus hairs in my leg, but they obviously weren't. It was just from the sting. So yeah, it was okay. It wasn't so bad. Jamie, I think, has had the worst luck. She's had them fall out of the light. 
while getting into the car and Stinger just before like, safari. Mine was a decent evening and I could go to bed if I wanted to. I didn't. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen a scorpion otherwise for quite some time. Sometimes we see them when we unroll the gym mats. They like to curl up in them. They're always around the gym equipment. Bim, have you been stung by a scorpion? He says, uh-uh, I have been very careful. That's wise words from VM. Serious wise words. Now, I'm hoping on our little boundary patrol, which we're doing at the moment, we're now just driving down Triple M, which is one of the, it's one of the western boundaries, that we're going to find a leopard. We're perhaps going to find Hukumori coming back to respond well, to Tingana's calls, wherever Tingana may be. Did you hear any of that? Luke, <laughs> please, can you say that all again? You sounded like a bit of a robot, and I couldn't make out what you were saying. Oh, Tandy. Do you want Tandy? I don't know if we'll see Tandy down here. Just because the last time, well, the last tracks we had of her, remember, went into Torchwood. So that's all the way on the southeastern boundary, and we're quite far away from that. So I wouldn't imagine she'd be down this side, but maybe Hukumori, Shudulu. Who knows? Maybe Gajima pops on. We're going to check a little bit of the northern sector as well. So I'm just going to scratch on some of these roads. But I actually underestimated how much rain we had. I thought that even on roads like this where, well, when I, like I say when the animals walk on it, they do put quite a deep depression, we paw print down in the sand. But mm, I take it back. The rain has washed everything away. So I haven't been able to see anything. And I'm also sad now. I think... We've got to the end of our tortoise challenge. I think now that the sun is probably almost setting and it's got quite cold, I wouldn't imagine that any of them would be out. So we should have started it from the beginning because then we would have had six tortoises. But instead, we only got four. Was it six or seven tortoises? We only six. Two more than the Italy. Hey? hey? Two more than Italy. Two more than Italy? What does that mean? Two more than Italy. Oh, initially. <laughs> I thought you said two more than Italy, and I thought there was some sports joke that I was supposed to get. <laughs> no, it just didn't hear for him properly. <laughs> oh, you see, South Africans can't even understand other South Africans. <laughs> Sometimes people just look at me when I've asked them something, and they're like, not even pardon, what? <laughs> Right, let's go across to David and see if he's been struggling trying to understand us, oh, well, our funny South African accent. <laughs> Whole road, one see. Right, still enjoying the rain, and I still got my hood on. I thought the rains were gone, but they are slowly coming back but still in business and I'm looking at the road here as it is passed forward let's see Sebastian if you can get this whole road going all the way through look at that beautiful road there and this shows the beauty of where we are both sides of the road covered with the thickets different colors of green different shades of green sorry about that and once it rains a lot like that very good job there Seb occasionally as the rain stops you'll see sometimes the cuts will start coming to the road to warm up because I think here the sand will soak and will suck the water very very quickly and that could be a good idea for us to keep on this road for the next few minutes and see how it looks like and we have done very well with the Ellis and as I said the rains bring a different ball game once it rains and if we hear Bobby that this could be a good road to drive on yes when we hear news of like say wild dogs have been spotted somewhere and we are doing the famous Ferrari safari this could be a clear road to go with because once I can tell you for a fact it doesn't have much traffic and you can fly low I mean when I look at it 
as we saw it on the camera there, I'm like, yes, should anything happen and I need to zoom? I'd really enjoy driving on this road, Bobby. And neither side, you know, apart from the trees and the thick vegetation, you see there's nothing else. Maxon, you're asking if these late rains might make the grass green again. I would think so. What would happen is I do not know for how long the rains might, you know, continue. And this being the beginning, maybe the beginning of winter, we would not be expecting to have any rains now. But again, uh, Mother Nature will always, you know, give you unexpected seasons like now. and nobody expected any rains like this we thought it could just speed for a few minutes and then stop but i think a solid two hours the rains have been going on eh? so let's see how it goes but if it will continue like this i'll not be surprised all these turning green but most likely the trees will lose their leaves as usual Twin to debate uh, what direction to take here. With the rains now changing the ball game for us, we also have to have a new, you know, new plants and finding out the animals. Taylor has something interesting. <laughs> I have a snake. I have a spotted bush snake, which is up here on the roof. I'm going to have to try and get it off the roof. Here's its tail. I'm going to have to actually catch it at some point so that I can release it safely. How cool is that? I got such a fright. First, I made VM search down in the distance <laughs> because I thought I'd seen a leopard walking on the road. Then I was upset because it wasn't a leopard. And the next minute, there's a snake coming down. And I immediately went, oh, my goodness, because I didn't know what it was. But it turns out it's a spotted bush snake, which is a harmless snake. And, well... They have a mild venom, however, it's not going to do anything to us. They're constrictors, so they normally will constrict their prey. Let me see where it is now. I wonder how long it's been in here for. It's okay, snakey. No, we don't like to handle snakes. I'm going to move it very quickly. And the only reason why I've picked it up is because I want to safely release it off of, and of course, a stupid earpiece cable. Has come out. Sorry, <laughs> I was standing on it. So I don't want to handle the snake. That's not my intention. But I need to get it off the roof. I'm going to release it onto a tree very quickly. There we go. Off we go. Don't touch snakes, everybody. Don't handle them. I'm never going to be able to get that thing off the roof. So. Like I said, a harmless one, quite a cool one. You can Google some pictures of spotted bush snakes or very variegated bush snakes. Sure, they gave me a fright. Its head was here, and at first I thought, if that's a boom slang, I'm getting out of the car, a venomous one. So just thought, very quickly move it. Only time I'll handle any reptiles is if I need to get them from point A to B safely. And I will not handle venomous snakes either, but that one, just quick and easy, gently by the tail. Didn't panicked a little bit, and then I think it realized that I wasn't interested in eating it. And then just popped it onto a tree. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Sammy Jane and the rest of the viewers. I think it would probably be enjoying its time up under the covers in the roof. It must have happened. Maybe it dropped out from a tree. I don't think it's been in there because VM and I actually had pulled all the covers down at one point. So we would have seen it. So it must have just somehow dropped onto the car as you maybe brush past. Maybe it, I don't know. I don't know how it got on there. That was really cool though. I'm glad it was a non venomous snake. Like I said, everybody, I need to stress to you, please. Don't be Indiana Jones or Steve Owen wannabes. Please don't handle anything that you don't know how to, especially something like a snake, even spiders and scorpions, because they can get hurt. The only reason I did that again is because I knew what it was. And, well, I think it's a lot happier now. I'm probably right and wondering what on earth is going on on top of the roof. 
Paula, now, the only, only reason I, why I knew that that snake was not venomous is because I'm very familiar with the spotted bush snake. It's a very common snake throughout Africa, in fact, not just South Africa, but, but growing up in wilderness-ish areas on stud farms and things like that, we used to see snakes lots. So I was taught as a young girl about the various snakes that you have out here. And... Uh, yeah, I suppose the only way you're going to know whether a snake is venomous or not is if you know exactly that it's that particular kind of snake. So there are a few things that pointed to me that it was a spotted bush snake. So it was it was sort of a greenish brown color, light sort of brown. It had spots on it and had a sort of light underbelly, which I know is very typical of the variegated bush snake. And its eye wasn't as massive as a boomslang. A boomslang has got a really big beady eye. And... Um, and this guy just, well, it didn't look like it. And I suppose you get used to it. So you can't just tell a snake uh, if it's venomous by looking at it. You have to actually know what it is, be able to physically identify it and then know what type of uh, venom it has. So a puff adder will be, of course, <laughs> caught by a puff adder. A puff adder would be a cytotoxin. You know, some of the mumbers and some of the blah, 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 blah. cobras and things have got like multiple kinds. But yeah, pretty cool though. I mean, a boomslang is a hem hemotoxic. I don't want to be bitten by a boomslang. I don't think that would be very nice. But I think you'd really have to annoy that boomslang to, get, slang to get bitten by one. There is a car behind me, so I'm just speeding up a little bit. So, and I'll turn off on the next road. But very cool. I think that Kaya, yes, that. Oh, let's go to David. Could be Tinga, no? Uh, we just spotted something very interesting here. Ladies and gentlemen, let's find out. It's a leopard and let's find out which leopard this is and how lucky I have spotted my first leopard on my own. Two seconds, we got a leopard right in the middle of the road there. Is that any better? Just hold on. My apologies there for that static noise and we got a leopard walking on the road and I would say this is my first personal sporting leopard. I've seen other leopards before that has been sported by my other guides or my other colleagues but I would say this one I just told Seb, look there's a leopard walking on the road there. One thing I have to say for a fact, I have no idea who this is, but I'm sure we will. Excellent, excellent. I have every reason to celebrate now. I mean, the rains, I would say, have brought me some very good omen, and we have really persevered the beating of the rain, but this is a great price, and we're gonna go and follow it slowly and closely as we find out who th this is. The other day there is a viewer who gave me the name the Tingana Whisperer. So I do not know whether it's Tingana, I do not know whether it's Fukumuri. What I know, it is a leopard and a beautiful, good looking leopard. I'm sure before long, you viewers, you'll tell me who this is. very cooperative just walking on the road giving us the best views i have no idea who he is or she, she is but we'll know i'll pray and hope it's tingana maybe not but i'm sure before long you'll tell me who he is my guess could be tingana and after all these rains it will have to keep marking it is territory because most of the scent marking done could be washed away by the rain I'm sure once we see the face, we'll be able to identify it positively. We don't want to lose the sighting, so we are going to follow it slowly until maybe when it will stop and settle down and have a good look on its face and know who exactly it is.
I'm not sure you can still hear the raindrops on the canopy of our roof and not as bad as it was before it's not as heavy it have really subsided well viewers that was my guess and if you say it is Chingana I will agree with you 100% and hopefully the viewer who gave me the name Chingana Whisperer I think it's paying for having given me that name. I also guess Chistingana, I'm yet to know how to do the IDs of these leopards here in South Africa, but well, if it's Chingana, that's the Duke T himself. And there he goes and he may want to keep on the road you would imagine walking in the wet grass there so I'd bet the you know having a bit of moisture on the road it doesn't have to fight with the drops being held by the grass or by the leaves or small bushes so it would want to keep the road as usual and still following the Duke Tingana again Let's... no worries he has stopped looking look you never know I'm sure all the viewers are digesting and enjoying this view of Tingana himself what are you up to Tingana what can you smell or what can you see Please don't forget to send us your questions. Twitter, hashtag Safari Life. Or keep following us on the YouTube chat stream, please. As we all enjoy watching this beautiful male leopard here. And we have what well, I think agreed it is Tingana. Alex Jumbo and thank you for joining us and by being a new viewer I'm in a country called South Africa but I am from East Africa in a country called Kenya thank you Alex for joining us please stay on board and be watching our shows twice in a day in the morning and in the afternoons I hope Alex you have joined us on the right time and good timing because we got something very interesting and rather unusual to spot Alex so I think you just got on board on a good day and a good time to view that leopard there so Luke we may have to go to infrared all right we've got Ralph who doesn't know what's happening out here in the rain as you might be going to infrared soon and enjoying staying dry as well thanks Dave but you know what I would actually prefer being wet out in the bush and following Tingana so good on you well done for finding him um, and just while they sorting themselves out getting a nice view of Tingana I thought I would just quickly show you another creature that we generally see coming out after we have some rains like we have had today and we need to be careful when we're driving because we have the African giant land snail that very often shows itself after it's um, been wetted around in the bush and these guys are um, the largest African snail and they are also the largest snail in the world believe it or not or that we know of potentially there are other snails that we've never seen um, but this one being the largest recorded snail in the world 
And these have been used as escargot, exported all over the world. So they are uh, protected here in the National Park, which is great for them. Uh, but they normally bury themselves underneath the surface of the soil. And once again, like the little frogs and the scorpions and things that stay under the surface of the soil, waiting for wetter times, as soon as that water starts trickling through to them and the moisture and they feel it, they then will then exit the ground often with lots of soil on top of it. So you almost think it's like a, a moving um, clump of, of dirt as they shift along the road. Now, they've also, they've got a very big, big foot underneath and that is lined with mucus that then helps them shift along the surface of the soil. And they also exhibit something called torsion, which um, allows the head of the body um, and the anterior body to be next to the posterior side of the body. So to put it uh, into simple terms, basically where the head is, uh, which normally sticks out a little bit over here, and you have that antenna that's poking out in the front there, um, that is normally the head, and right next to it, at that part of the shell there, is where the anus is. So the head and the anus are literally right next to each other, and you must think because if the anus was on the inside, it would be very uh, unclean, it would be dirty. And so the anus right next to the head, and that's where it will then uh, defecate out of the top there as well. Now, CNAC, we do get slugs, but they only are around the permanent wet areas because slugs don't even have the shell that can protect them. So we do have some, but literally down uh, in those wet areas. So not very common at all. Another thing about a snail is, is that it is a hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite meaning that it's got m both male and female uh, body parts, but it does need to meet up with another snail just to uh, swap little sperm packages. Now, there was a question, somebody asking uh, what eats uh, or feeds on these. Uh, Azira, well, lots of things feed on these, from humans to birds to different mammals, honey badgers and polecats and all sorts of things. So very, very important source of food, not only for us, but lots of animals as well. And this is actually a carnivore. Can you believe it? A snail that is a carnivore, it feeds on carrion. So it is an absolutely amazing organism or creature that comes out this time, uh, especially after the rain, but this time of year, maybe they won't come out so much because it's not so warm, it's the wrong time of year, even though we've had some rain, but who knows? Normally it's in the springtime, into summer, uh, when we have that first bit of rain, that all these creatures start to come out of the ground. So absolutely fascinating, we're getting some rain, we can't complain, and I tell you, we can't complain as well, especially when we have Tingana. Well, hopefully this is Tingana. He just stopped in the bush in front of us. You can see slight movement of him there. And we do not know exactly what he wants to do. And what I want us to have is a proper view of his face. And maybe we can identify him 150%. It is Tingana. But from the look of things, I got a feeling it's a male by, you know, the big head, the big body size and a bit of dewlap that I saw slightly on the neck, it's a male. And once we get the view of his face, then I'll be more than happy to prove it to my friend Tingana. So he could be sheltering himself a bit from the rain under that bush willow there. And again, I was saying earlier, when it rains, most cats will not like the rain because of their fur on their bodies, which keeps them, you know, cold and sometimes would give them slight infections, be it fever or sometimes pneumonia, if the rain is so heavy or they inhale a lot of cold or they breathe a lot of cold. Should we back up a little bit? So let's see what the super cameraman Seb wants and maybe we'll have a different view of this beautiful cat and maybe be able to identify him 100% who he is. We'll just change the angle slightly bit. 
he's still there, he's not going anywhere. We are now in infrared, not wanting to shine any light on him. And unfortunately, because of the rain, we still have a panel, you know, there. That's why we have to struggle to give you a very unique angle because I can only do 12 o'clock for Seb. So how is that, Seb? Okay, Stop here. Paula, you're asking how far do leopards see in the dark? I would say they have wonderful visions like most cats and most so leopards and lions, but I think leopards would be, not very sure, but I see they'll see better in the dark than all the other two big cats we got in Africa. How far, I do not know Paula for a fact how far they would see, but I have found out myself out of experience most of the successful hunts are at night, so I would imagine they would see pretty good at night. How far? I would not be able to know, especially here, with all the thickets around. There he is, and I think he's sheltering more of the rain than anything else, because it's still pouring. But me and Seb are still in business here. blends in very well. You just walk where he is or pretty close to the road, you not see him. I don't know what he spotted. He just shot up. He's moving, he's moving. He must have seen something. And Sinak leopard would get anybody, you know, civets. Leopards, mongooses, leopards would attack anybody when they're hungry and the opportunities seen occur, right? You're asking whether, you know, a leopard would attack, for example, civet. Yes, leopards, when an opportunity is right, like now they see a civet move or um, even a mongoose move, they will go for them, Sinak. They have such a wide diversity of the meals or for the animals or the prey they hunt for. He must have spotted something, I guess. I do not know what he is watching. But from that body language, it's very clear there's something he is looking at. Minamu. You'd like to know why do leopards scrap their hind legs when they scent mark? I would think one of the reasons is to make sure the scent marking goes right below the ground and then they want to cover it and by so doing it gets protected there and it will stay. I'm not sure she had me and it will stay and the scent will remain there for a longer period. So you have seen sometimes when the cats do the same, and my guess is they scrap, then they spray the urine and cover a little bit, and that way it will keep it fresh for a long time, so that any other leopard that will swing by there, it will pick the scent easily. That would be my guess, Minamu. But that's a very, very good question and very good observation. I'd say you have you know, been following as you watch the leopard's scent mark. He definitely saw something and his eyes are still glued in that direction. How are you? What did you see? I'm trying to count the spots there. Maybe it could be wrong and maybe the viewers now, Luke, you can ask them whether they have been able to identify 200% if this is my friend Tingana or not from the spot pattern there. I counted something like five, I could be wrong. I'm yet to become a good expert. I love you all. Thank you for identifying my friend Tingana. Many thanks. Very good job and I love the way you're doing it. I'm slowly catching up with you to become an expert in identifying the leopards here in South Africa. He's making a move. I do not know where he's heading to now, 
But again, as we have done before, we'll slowly and surely follow him quietly and see where he will take us. Tila, do you have anything for us as I follow Tingana? Please be a frog, please be a frog. What's that, VM? Is it a frog or is it a stone? Is it a stone? Why does it look like it's radioactive? <laughs> don't you think? Is it shooting up at the night over? I don't know what that is. <laughs> it really looks like this rock. I don't even know. I don't understand what it is. Can let me drive closer? Why? I see weird things. I was so excited because I thought it was going to be a bushveld rain frog, but it isn't. I'm just figuring out what it is. Oh, it's not even a rock. It's a leaf. <laughs> That's so disappointing. It was just a leaf. We've got a forktail drongo trying to be a pill spotted outlet. You're not fooling anyone. Anyways, that was a, that was not my finest moment, but it did look like that leaf was radioactive. I thought so. <laughs> it fooled everyone. Everybody's been tricked today. Hashtag got tricked. Even me, don't worry. Okay, what are we going to look for now? I don't know if we're going to be able to top the snake accident that we had. <laughs> Oi. Hop and a skip over there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that was really cool to see that snake. Vim and I also have been talking about where on earth did it come from because I was actually thinking, I was like, I haven't really driven through any trees today. We've just stayed on the roads. And I, I remember brushing past one guari tree. So unless it came from that guari tree, I have no idea where it fell from. Quite kind of creepy. Oh, hyena. We'll have that. Here we go. Hello, hyena charging out onto the road who have we got here a little bit of extra lighting ralph we're not far from you we're not far from you at all but nervous of us there he goes the hyena very cool ralph will be excited he can play the identification game Woo! enjoy ralph i'm not very good at identifying the hyenas i find it quite difficult very cool though racing off into the distance I don't think we're going to be able to follow it. Is it still going down the road? Let's see. No, I think it has turned off. I think it's gone back onto Vuitella Access. I mean, hey. Yeah, there it is. So we follow it back this way. We haven't got anything else to do. Oh, Alex, you said, yeah, hyena. Yup. Very cool that we got one. I'm happy. Let's see where it's going to go. I'm not going to be off-roading after this hyena, but for as long as it runs down the road, we'll try and see it. If I give you some more light there, VM, does that help? It's difficult to do the, the drive and view in infrared. Maybe not so bad. Stopping, having a little smell. I'm going to keep the car going. The reason why is because Wendy's particularly difficult to start, as you've all noticed. So we just keep going slowly and try and follow and see where it goes. And I'll keep some distance between us and the hyena. But very nice. So if you do know who this hyena is, I can't wait for you to tell me. I think it's done just up. Uh, can't, yeah, I can't wait for you to tell me who it is. Hashtag Safari Live. Let us know. I wonder who it is. I thought it looked like a male. Oh, let me... Let me pick up the pace quickly. We've got a bit far behind it, so I need to make up some some room. But for a hyena, very easy to, well, I suppose, navigate through here. Looking off to the right, going down to the right now. Stopped like it listened and heard something. Okay, we'll have a little check. Oh, I don't know. Hyena, where'd you go? Went off into the bushes. Will we see it again? There it is. Disappearing into the darkness where who knows what it will get up to. Very nice, a nocturnal creature. Yay, the crowd goes wild. Well, I'm excited, let's see how you know. Elephants today, a snake, I've been wanting to see a snake. I think every afternoon I go out, I say I want to see a snake. I go to 
well, remove a snake from the roof of Wendy. I don't know if she's ever had a snake on her before. Maybe. Wendy's an old car. She probably had lots of things, lots of animals. Oi! No, that's not going to work. And the steering wheel is so slippery too. Okay, almost ready, almost there. Boop. <laughs> Paul, you said that that hyena's name is Geraldine, likes long, long walks on the beach and impalas. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. I don't think that that's Geraldine. Is there a hyena named Geraldine? No, have I been not concentrating? Because that's also a possibility that I just didn't know. Uh, very funny. I thought that was highly amusing. Okay, right, next hyena or next mammal species, please. I'm going to have to put my Ziploc shoe protector on in a minute. So I'm trying to get a really catchy name going for it. But not working so far because my shoes are now getting so wet how am i going to dry them maybe i'll put them in vm can my shoes go in your bed with you they'll they don't smell too much just a little bit <laughs> only scorpions in your bed okay vm won't take my shoes with him so that they get nice and dry it's okay i thought we were friends I would have done that for you. <laughs> Talking absolute nonsense now, hoping that an animal is going to pop up and save me, but maybe my luck is going to run out. David seems to be having all the luck this afternoon. Hey, first a great elephant sighting and now Tinga Banana. Very cool. I'm so happy that Tingana is back and walking some of his old roots again. That's very good. Bet everybody's super excited. Right, speaking of David and Tingana, if Tingana leads David off road, he might give him a bit of a challenge. Tingana is still on the move. He is putting a lot of signs of hunting mode, but he's putting us in very thick bushes here. So we are not sure how far we're going to follow him, but he got all signs of looking for dinner. Come on for a minute. Let's see. He's putting us in all the thickets and it's getting dense and dense where we are. Service. So we just hang on, we do a little swing here. Okay. Yeah. right there yeah let's just make a little move in the front and we'll see what we can see that's good back up did you have him reverse a little bit let me know keep coming Is that? Okay, let me know when to stop. Keep going. How is that? All right, that's where Tingana is at the moment, giving us a back view and again looking at something we do not know. And he's seriously on a hunting mission. He clearly put some stalking mode a few minutes ago and went under, we lost him, and then we have found him again. And we have to be very, very patient when you're with leopards. Patience is very, very important. And they'll always be sure when they want to make a move, especially if they want to hunt, because they will always, in general, pounce on their prey, unlike giving a chase. And what a big cut, Stingana is eh? Leopards themselves are always very, very patient also when they want to hunt. They're never in a rush. 
because they know the cost of missing a kill. They'll always, of course, once in a while, miss a prey, but they have learned, I would guess, look at that beautiful eye there. That being patient is very, very important, and you plan very, very nicely. You make a very good strategy before you commit to jump and pounce on any prey that is in front of you. I truly respect how leopards do their kills. They'd be in one spot for even a whole 20, 30 minutes waiting for the right moment to make a move. Tingano surprised me the other day with having two kills which were barely 300 yards or 300 meters or so apart from each other. What do you have to Tingana today? You need to show us you are truly the Duke of this area and Hukumuri or Hosanna will not be able to match to your level or to your standard any time soon. Rains still continuing, you can hear the drops. Laura, you say he is handsome. Truly he is, and I agree with you. I agree with you totally. He is handsome. Whichever angle you look at him, behind the head, the body, when you see the face, he is magnificent, Leopard Laura. Well, leopards have been known sometimes even to go for frogs. Ruff, tell us something. Everybody, shame. I'm just, I've got a little bushveld rain frog here. And sorry, we're just trying to see him there without him falling off the table. Uh, there we are. Sorry, Craig. He's just, he's a feisty little fellow. And these are one of the guys that will come out um, after the rains like this. But uh, this is a very young one now because remember the, these little rain frogs they bury themselves in the ground and they'll come out once that moisture comes through and there's a little very special call that they give off. It's a rap, rap, rap. And so these are endemic to South Africa and we also get the desert rain frog in Namibia also endemic there this is a very small one they do get quite a lot bigger than this and they'll also when they come out after the rain it's normally perfect timing because um, the little alates and all sorts of other little things come out of the ground the termites and so they very often go and sit in front of those termite mounds and uh, just wait for the termites to come out and pick them off one by one and then as it gets hot again, they'll bury themselves back in the soil and uh, wait for another rainy day. So as you can see, there is an absolute abundance of life that normally sits just below the surface of the soil. And all it takes is for a little bit of rain to come through and all these crazy little amazing creatures start making them their way out of the ground. Now, Paula, it is tiny, but this one has the potential to grow a lot more than this. So this is a little baby bushveld rain frog. They do get quite a lot bigger than that. And they've got real attitude about them. They don't jump. They just walk. They don't swim. They blow themselves up and they float. So everything about them is almost against the grain. They are the real rebels of the frog world. And they don't do things like other frogs do. And if they've got any dirt or anything of their, on their eye, they just wipe it off with their very short, stumpy legs. And they are absolutely amazing. They are my most favorite frog or amphibian. And they are absolutely fascinating. I love it. A little bushveld rain frog. So these are the little creatures that you've got to look out for now after any little bit of rain. Uh, Luke saying he feels like this after his morning breakfast. Well, sorry for you, Luke. You shouldn't eat so much. <laughs> but he looks really cool. That is so cool. I really love these guys. And I tell you what, don't worry, everybody. I will be releasing him off into the wet grass immediately after we've finished this. 
So don't worry for this little guy. I'll give him the best chance possible for him to make it through. He's just got to keep that attitude up because it'll go a long way to keeping him alive in the bush. Right, it seems like the amphibians are all starting to show themselves. I'm going to go and let this guy with attitude go into the bush. Let's go to Taylor. It seems she's found another one. I can't really see what it is. I think it might be a grass frog or a grass frog or a ridge frog. They're all the same. I don't really know. It looks like it's got some black markings on its face. But that's as close as we can go, hey? I mean, I don't know. But too close. Hmm. Mm, let's see. Because I can't really see make out much of it from that angle. I mean, I don't think you can either. Let me see if I can try and change the angle slightly. But this is quite cool. At least we're getting a frog. We're winning on the safari today. Okay, you ready? Are you ready, VM? We're going to start. We're going to shake, but we're going to leave it like that. There we go. Now we can follow it. Now we can sort of test. I've now lost it, though. Oh, that is it. We're going to watch. You have to tell me when. We're going to drop down as well. We should start going down now. Okay. There we go. A little bit further back. Deep. There we go. Just trying to get as close as we can to it. So that's quite cool to see. What are you, though? The little tree frog. Trying to find where the... Give it a little bit of light. Maybe a little tree frog. Foam nest frog? I can't really see that. I can't really make it out. Um, I'm trying to see. You know, you can't even see the patterns there. Eh? No. Please turn around. I can't see if it's got any stripes or anything on its leg either. It's very difficult to tell. But normally, juvenile frogs, if it is a juvenile frog, are typically quite mottled. But that's quite cool. Magic dragon was in there. You've asked if we've got them big birds. They could eat a what? What could they eat, Luke? I've got forgotten. Big, eat big, yes, big frogs that can eat a bird. Hmm. What about an African bullfrog? I've never seen an African bullfrog ever eating a bird, but I wouldn't put it past me. I wouldn't put it past a bullfrog, in fact. That's an interesting little frog. I don't really know what it actually is. I wish I could see it again now and I could see its face. Um, but no, we don't have... We don't have giant bullfrogs out here. I think they would eat birds. Uh, and then that's sort of the biggest. They even like the raucous toads and things like that, they're not particularly big that they'd be eating any birds at all. Oi, that was a little stumpy that we get all the time. Okay. Well, hopefully the next time you come back to us, Vim and I have got one last song for you to end the night. But off you go back to Tingana, and I don't know if he started to sing just yet. just jumped two seconds ago and let's find out what he might have jumped to and we just lost him I just hold on for a few seconds and can you see him there except he's right there so let's make one more swing here we can see him and he is definitely interested in getting something for dinner we slowly, without disturbing him, want to uh, hang on. We still have the panels on the side of the road and on the side of the car. That's why it's quite a challenge for Seb to do what he's supposed to do. And move forward a little bit. Oh. Okay, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's making a few attempts here, I think, of trying to get something for dinner. How is that, Seb? Okay, go to my right. How is that? He's more boil again. Let's try and see that he's eating something there. Stop there. Yeah, just to our left. You see him there? He just moved again. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. We have a very tight angle today of filming. You can see him there? Because we still have the panels on the side of the car. But there is our Tingana. And he's seriously on a mission to get something on the table for dinner tonight. How lovely to see him a day later after having 
had all the time the other day. We had him last night and I can tell you from where he was and where he is now is a whole, I would say, almost five miles away. They travel a lot, these cats. He is definitely concentrating on something. Taylor, got something? It's just walking away. We have a white-tailed mongoose that was running next to the car for quite some time. It was quite cool. And then it crossed the road. I'm pretty sure it's our friend from last year, Winter. Uh, Tristan and I got to know quite well. Actually, the year before, 2016, Jamie and I spent lots of time with a white-tailed mongoose up here on the open plains. But it is far away. It is disappearing. But very cool to see the larger species of mongoose that we have. Very cool, walking around in the grass, looking for something to eat, probably trying to get a lot of beetles and bugs that have maybe been flushed out of their burrows. Maybe some alates have re been released from mounds. Oh, we're going to lose it now, sadly. Very cool, though. How nice to see. Yeah. What a cool drive it's been, hey? Just when I was thinking it's a slow, I had the most amazing things. That was epic. I'm so sorry to have stolen you away from Tingana, but I thought that would be quite cool, quite something different. Worth it, hey, to see variety. We always talk about these creatures. We don't often get to see them. Maybe we get to see it again. Who knows? I'm looking. There's lots of scrub hairs around tonight as well. Hello, Impala. Liam, are you ready? Quickly, do a trumpet. Okay, you start. I'll join in. <laughs> Sunset Safari, it was a lot of fun. Vio and I thought we'd just do a, a little trumpet session because it will be the last time that I do it with him for a while before he heads on holiday. But you can join us for all the fun again. Same place, not the same time. Tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Until then, cheerio.